All right, check one, two. All right, we got some people in the room. If everyone wants to give me a little shout out in the chat, just let me know audio's coming in good. Hopefully there's no buzz or feedback. I uh, just got this all set up for the first time, so there may be, hopefully, no glitches, but it's possible. <laughs> uh, let's see here. All right. All right, there we go. All right, welcome everybody. How's it going? Uh, all right, things are looking good. I've got some eyes on. Sorry for the delay for everybody who was uh, <laughs> waiting. A little uh, hiccup here. I just came off of work and was rushing in here to uh, get everything set up and ready to go. And since this is my first time on this rodeo, uh, there was just a little bit of a delay, but it's all good. All right. All right. So looks like we're good. Okay. Uh, so this is um, this is going to be something quite different, I think, for uh, everybody here. Um, uh, what we're looking at here is uh, some concept work that I had started on my own time when I was um, working with uh, NPC on the Lion King. Um, a lot of people may not know that uh, I wound up working on that show, but. Uh, I'm not credited because my work didn't make it into the feature film at the end, unfortunately. Um, there was uh, not enough time to implement what I was working on, but uh, in my off time I'd come home and still concept stuff and just try to develop ideas. And uh, this is something that I was working on um, that was taken much further. And um, so I'll uh, I'll give you guys kind of the uh, the backstory here, but it was it's Mufasa in the clouds. That was um, that was my my deal. <laughs> And uh, it was a pretty amazing opportunity. Um, I'm a huge Lion King fan. Uh, I love the movies, and uh, yeah, so to be able to work on the uh, the new one was super exciting. Um, so this is going to be kind of a completion, I guess, of what I of what I would love to have seen, or at least something close to it. But will be uh, something that will be 3D printable, and uh, I think I'm going to, uh, yeah see how far I can take this and then uh, I'm probably gift it to somebody uh, a person or two who uh, who I was working with uh, on that show um, yeah the Lion King is uh, something that's just been uh, you know, close to my heart since I was a kid um, and it's, uh, yeah I've been an artist since I was a child but uh, for a long time I wasn't sure that that's what I wanted to do with my life uh, in high school um, you know, my, my parents, my dad in particular, really convinced me to, um, to think about being a doctor. Uh, so I wound up actually pursuing medicine for quite a while. Um, but art was never far behind. And uh, eventually I had to say that I, I just I wasn't satisfied with the sciences. Um, and so I wound up uh, dropping out of college my junior year and said, screw this. <laughs> Um, I worked two years in an ER as an advanced tech, so I did everything except administer meds, and that led to um, some pretty some pretty amazing experiences. But uh, it also wound up uh, letting me know that um, I was a lot happier creating art and wanting to impact people's lives through a, a positive means in the entertainment industry rather than um, uh, doing it physically. Uh, <laughs> uh, working in medicine was uh, was pretty was pretty trying. Um, and so uh, I felt guilty though because I really wanted to do something with my life that was meaningful and that would uh, that would matter you know that I knew would be something that would last and um, you know physically tangibly helping people is something that um, you know it's, it's pretty hard to to not think about that um, having a lasting impact on someone's life um, but yeah suffice it to say uh, art went out and I uh, had to struggle with uh, feeling guilty about that or not because um, yeah I thought that uh, for a while I was like well you know helping someone physically that's, that's like the epitome of doing something with your life that's that's meaningful but of course you know that's this is one of many things that can uh, can positively affect people and so eventually I looked at my life and said well you know what do I love about art so much what do I love about filmmaking and storytelling well it was the impact it had on me and how it touched me and moved me as a child um, so that's what really kind of, uh, I guess, led me to pull away from art and science, uh, I mean, from art, I should say. I mean, 
science, excuse me, and uh, really get serious about art um, and not feel guilty about leaving medicine. Um, yeah, so, uh, let's see, after college, I, um, I uh, started doing freelance graphic design for a while and then eventually discovered ZBrush um, because I was such a fan of concept art. And I would always go into Barnes and Noble and pick up uh, different magazines and books. And a lot of times I wind up uh, picking up like Imagine FX or uh, 3D Artist Magazine. And that's eventually where I saw people talking about this program called ZBrush. And I was like, that looks appealing. That looks like something that I can really wrap my brain around. Uh, I knew about Maya, I knew about Soft Image but they always seemed just so intimidating and something that was just not my cup of tea. So I stayed away from 3D for a while and was just kind of a Photoshop junkie and, and got pretty good with, uh, you know, photo manipulation and kit bash or photo bashing. Uh, but it wasn't until I really took a dive into ZBrush that I realized that this was the gateway drug to 3D for me. <laughs> this is what, uh, would kind of open the floodgates uh, into um, really chasing uh, my dreams and um, a lot of that is is still something in the process but um, ZBrush has really kind of just been this this connective tissue to uh, allowing me to progress toward the, uh, the bigger picture of ideas that I've had for a long time and 3D printing kind of just came along um, and sort of came into its own right when I started getting um, seriously involved in the professional um, way. Uh, let's see, Dexter, what are you asking? How long have you been using ZBrush? Uh, man, I guess I got serious about it in like 2012, 2011. No, yeah, probably 2010, 2011, actually. Um, that's when I started getting serious about it. Um, it was... Let's see. So it was a bit after college. I, I dropped out my junior year, which was 2002. And uh, that's pretty much when ZBrush was invented, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and then after that, it took a while before I really came around to it, but that was like 2010, I think, or 2011. And uh, I was working at that time, I was working um, teaching inner city children um, art classes and uh, working. Um, as an art teacher slash coach and, uh, you know, helping with uh, after school programs for, you know, homework and that kind of stuff um, for underprivileged kids. And it was just a way for me to make a living using art. And I kind of figured out this, this method early on of do the best you can to make a living doing what you want to do or at least learning what you want to do to make a living uh, so that you can kind of maximize your time. So you're not just working a job you hate, <laughs> which I did a, a bit of for sure. Uh, and then um, then working on your passion or doing something that's useful for your passion only after you're exhausted from a job. Um, so to give an example, um, not that I hated them, but it definitely is taxing on your uh, on your body and your mind when you're, uh, you're waiting tables for a long time or uh, doing landscaping or um, even even working in the medical field. I mean, it's uh, I was working in one of the top 50 hospitals in the country um, for two years in the ER. So I was the youngest person they ever hired. So it was definitely an accomplishment even uh, at that uh, level for me. Um, but it still was something that I just, I wasn't fulfilled by. And I was really just conflicted with that. So um, I was working in this cafe, or I was working like this on a Cintiq on uh, connected to my MacBook Pro, <laughs> uh, sitting early, I, w I went downtown to uh, to go to work to, at this uh, at this uh, community center where I was working for uh, with kids, and uh, I was sitting in this cafe that I love to go to, and I was just doing what I'm doing now, but on a different piece, and uh, I already had a bunch of assets textured and. Uh, this is actually this Echo the Dolphin tribute piece, and I think I was mostly working Photoshop at that time, um, just encompassing uh, or just uh, utilizing just a few assets of ZBrush, but I was still mostly a Photoshop junkie at that time. And uh, this woman walked by my uh, table where I was sculpting and, uh, and uh, digitally painting, and then she came back around. She was like, 
oh my god, that's really good. Who are you? What do you do? And uh, I went on to explain that uh, I was an artist. Uh, I was working in, um, you know, that inner city school uh, community center. And uh, I was looking to um, just do whatever I can to, you know, further my skills. And so she said, well, my company's hiring and uh, we're looking for some artists with your skill set if you would like to apply. So this company was called Chiyoda America and they are a Japanese company um, that has some American branches and European branches and they specialize in laminate surface texturing. So what that is is uh, think of IKEA furniture, think of Formica countertops, uh, giant textures of wood, stone, and whatever else in between that's what they specialized in so they had artists work on um, researching and um, mimicking and editing scans they'd have these giant bed scanners that they would uh, they would take real pieces of wood stone whatever was like the most popular and um, they'd find the trends and so they send their artists uh, to these massive you know interior design shows and really get uh, a sense of what was popular, what was trending, and then they'd make the knockoffs, essentially, the, uh, you know, the imitation wood, stone, whatever, so it looks and maybe even feels real, but of course it's just uh, a laminated, thin little piece of textured, painted, dyed plastic and uh, paper and whatnot that's laminated over top of particle board, you know. So this is stuff that winds up in kids' dorm rooms and uh, apartments and, uh, you know, just just it's just cheap furniture so um, <laughs> so not exactly the dream job for an artist but uh, some people love it so more power to them but for me that was uh, it wasn't my first choice but it was like it was an opportunity that came my way and I thought all right why not I'll, I'll apply so uh, she she also uh, enticed me by saying that there was uh, some pretty nice uh, pretty nice international travel uh, connected to it so I was like cool uh, I'm in so I applied and I wound up getting the job, um, beating out apparently like a hundred other applicants. Uh, and um, so the job initially was some pretty incredible travel. Got to go to Europe for a while. Um, uh, went to Belgium. Uh, then went to uh, had a little bit of time in London and some time in Cologne, Germany. And uh, went to a bunch of trade shows there. Saw some pretty incredible stuff. Um, I mean, the scale of these trade shows is like bigger than Comic Con as far as both like the scale of the area it takes up, the convention centers, and the height of some of these booths were like two, three stories tall. Just bananas. Amazing. Uh, you know, they'd have full like sections of houses in there. They'd have uh, these, um, they had almost like this Alice in Wonderland theme for this one gigantic, I can't even call it a booth. It was just like a massive section of this huge uh, company's plot of land <laughs> in this uh, huge, like city sized convention center so uh, they had like giant mushroom shaped cloth draped frames with all these really cool like creative different furniture it was just it was wild so that travel and those shows were were amazing but um, eventually Chioda and I had to part ways because it was just not fulfilling that scratch, that itch for a character artist like myself. So um, I, I, we parted ways and I was like, I need to get back to uh, my roots. I need to get back to like what really um, inspired me, you know, which is visual storytelling and creatures and characters. And uh, so um, I had been attending uh, this convention called a Lexicon for several years now. And it would always happen around it was like an early Christmas. I think it was like in November back then, or even maybe December, somewhere around there. It was close to the holidays. And so it was always this amazing reunion of all these insanely talented artists. Um, just to name drop a few, I mean, Boris Vallejo and Julie Bell, like amazing fantasy artists, some of the best painters in the world. Um, their kids are also super talented. Uh, they were there, Greg Manchus. Um, oh man, um, the, uh, Hilt, Greg Hildebrand. Um, Jordu Shell would show up a lot. Um, man, uh, I mean, just the list goes on and on. Um, Donato, um, Dan DeSantos, um, man, Justin Gerard, 
uh, actually, he and I uh, were in college together for a bit. Um, the guy's just incredibly talented. So I just met all these amazing artists and became friends with a lot of them, and uh, even was lucky to um, help out with the convention later on and um, kind of helped just uh, facilitate their um, their sketch sessions during uh, during a few years that I was attending. Uh, and I say a few only because I wound up eventually um, becoming good friends with. Um, well, I forget exactly who led me or who recommended. I think it might have been Mark Sheff, another really talented artist um, and friend. He, I think, recommended I attend the illustration master class up in Amherst, Massachusetts. And so coming back full circle to what I was saying, Chiota America wore, it's out, wore out its welcome with me, and I was like, I need to get back to the arts. I need to get back to characters. So, um, so I remembered what Mark had said, and I thought, all right, I'm going to use the rest of my savings and money that I have and pay for this multi, you know, it was like several thousand dollar course, but you get to learn at the feet of all these amazing, amazing artists and, and more, you know, many that I hadn't met before. Um, I think even Malcolm Gladwell was there that year. From the, no, no, it wasn't Malcolm. It was, um, oh, who's the other guy? Well, I'm drawing a blank right now. Uh, but another renowned author and writer and artist. Um, anyway, so I went to the Amherst uh, College. I went to their uh, the illustration master class. And there um, I wound up meeting uh, the legendary artist Ian McKegg and his daughter Mishi and uh, to this day they're still uh, good friends especially Mishi um, we've even I've been lucky enough to to call her friend for years now and a uh, couple couple uh, years I was stranded here in LA either once due to being so busy with work that I, uh, I really couldn't leave and then another year where I was practically so broke I couldn't afford a flight home uh, I grew up in Pennsylvania by the way so uh, Mishi has been so kind and gracious in my life and she invited me to uh, spend Thanksgiving with her and her friends for uh, what we call it an orphan Thanksgiving right that's that's her uh, her name for it which is great so a lot of us who either are people who don't have family or people who couldn't go back home or whatnot um, we always uh, she always has the door open and so it's been uh, it's been great knowing her and, and being able to be uh, friends with her and uh, and you know, it's it's always just as many people know Ian's work. I mean, he's also just an amazing person as far as uh, just his uh, character goes and his um, integrity and kindness is is just uh, uh, you know his uh, reputation precedes him, <laughs> as they say. So uh, th I went there and I met them, became friends with them, and uh, was just so inspired. And it was exactly what I needed. You know, the money was no object in the end, even though I was like, I was dropping tons of my cash on this thing at the time. Um, it was awesome. I, I just, that event and that time was uh, invaluable. And just for the networking and the friendships and the connections that were made too. So I highly recommend if you're, uh, if you're an artist who, whether you're seasoned or whether you're uh, very new, if you can um, get a spot, because I know they sell out pretty quick, um, and you can save up the money, uh, definitely go to the Illustration Masterclass in Amherst. It's uh, uh, incredible. <laughs> so uh, that connection and that friendship with Mishi has lasted through the years, and uh, at that time I was still on the East Coast, but eventually um, I wound up working online with uh, Ryan Kingsling, who used to uh, be part of Pixelogic, and I did work on ZBrush Workshops thanks to uh, uh, one of his, uh, at that time, employees and became a good friend of mine as well, William Detry, and he had me uh, join them for a while. So after I took two courses with them, I was then helping them uh, with Jewish workshops for a while, and that was, again, a super enlightening <laughs> experience and very helpful. Um, that's how I got to know um, Paul Gabry, and I think that's also how I really kind of sped up my... Uh, my ZBrush skills um, was was doing mastering ZBrush with Paul. I was one of the facilitators for him, and uh, then that led to flying out here to California. At that time, I was still in Pennsylvania. Came out to SIGGRAPH, got to meet Paul for the first time, and uh, Solomon Blair, also from Pixo, and uh, eventually Solomon and I became roommates for about a year. And uh, that's actually where I live now, is the apartment that we both used to uh, live in together. Um, so it, Pixelogic and ZBrush has really been uh, a huge part of my life and my artistic journey. Um, it's really, uh, it's, it's literally fed me. It's literally been how I survive. And that is crazy to say as somebody who, um, you know, was in a totally different field, but I knew in my heart since I was a kid. You know, I was this crazy kid that in late high school, 
I guess it was late high school. It was ninety seven. Um, or 96, whatever, Jurassic, uh, when The Lost World came out, you know, I was so inspired by that because I, I had been such a huge fan of the uh, all the artistry, and I love Michael Crichton's books, like, all of them are just, like, 90% of them I'm just a huge fan of, and, uh, of course, Lost World and Jurassic Park were two of my biggest um, uh, influences as a kid, and uh, those films, especially the first one, but after the second one came out, I was just so, just enamored with the work of uh, Crash, and Stan Winston, um, that I started drawing dinosaurs as a mural on my bedroom wall. And thankfully my parents were cool with it. They were just like, eh, let him do what he wants. You know, I used to have posters up all the time and then I was like, nah, screw this. I'm gonna replicate Crash's work on my wall, like large scale mural. I never finished it, but it was a pretty good, pretty good T-Rex. <laughs> I was pretty proud of it. Um, anyway, um, getting off track here. So, uh, yeah, art has just been, has always been in my life. Um, instead of learning sports or how to throw a ball, my dad taught me how to draw. Like, uh, you know, not, nothing against sports. I'm not really a big fan of um, watching them per se, but I love playing them. And uh, I, I went up taking like Taekwondo and some Krav Maga and, uh, you know, a little bit more uh, martial arts centric stuff during college. So, uh, love pickup games of basketball. But man, for me, sports though overall, just, it wasn't really that, important to me it was all about the arts so I'm so grateful my dad taught me how to draw when I was a kid because that um, that was the seed that really kind of sparked everything else um, and that led me down this road um, so flashing forward um, into the time of um, after Amherst and after uh, connecting with uh, Zebish workshops uh, I wound up uh, getting a job at a theater while also at the same time migrating from Zubish Workshops to the Stan Winston School of Character Arts, which was kind of another dream opportunity in a lot of ways for a young artist who was still honing his craft and still getting better at his work and you know building his portfolio. And uh, I just happened to, it's all this interconnection, you know, the, it's a small world in the arts, like any industry, the higher up you get in any industry and the more top people you get to know, the more you find out they all know each other, right? So it's always important to do your best not to burn any bridges and to um, learn to bite your tongue too if anyone <laughs> wrongs you. <laughs> Be careful, Call your, uh, pick your battles wisely. Um, but uh, on the positive side of things, I uh, had known um, of Jordi Shell for a while now and he, he knew my name enough, you know, and he knew my face. So uh, I was on Facebook um, one of these days when I was working from home, um, finishing up work with Zebra's Workshops. And I saw Jordi Shell was doing a live stream with uh, Stan Winston School of Character Arts. And, uh, and I thought, oh, that'd be cool. I'll just pop in there and see if maybe I can jump on. And they would have like four or five people on the same uh, stream, like kind of join in with this video. And then I guess they could type in questions. And uh, it was like a Google Hangout, I think, or something like that. Anyway, uh, I jumped in there and I was lucky to be selected as one of the five people. And they kept me on there for a while. And so. Um, I asked Jordu, I think something about Jordu had publicly said that someone had broken into his place and and uh, <laughs> and it was terrible and they, they stole some stuff and it was just bad and I was like, dude, I was just asking him, like following up since uh, I think he and I were friends on Facebook at that time already because uh, we had met at the uh, Alexicon uh, convention and so I said, hey, did they ever, you know, did they ever follow up on that? Did they ever catch the guys who, who stole your stuff? And he was just like... <laughs> Jordy was never short with quips or, or whipping out a quick joke and uh, if you know anything about him he's hilarious and uh, he was like hey Daniel your last name's De Leon right I bet they're your cousins man they're gonna come for you and I'm like dude what the hell man <laughs> I was like it's so racist um, but <laughs> it was uh, it was totally all obviously in good jest but um, it was hilarious and so I think uh, there was definitely a, a rapport that was seen by Matt um, that I had with Jordu and uh, and then uh, Matt Winston. And so anyway, I w after that stream, I messaged Matt later on and was just like, hey, uh, I don't know if uh, you have anybody covering this, but I, I've been working on social media for a bit with Zebra's Workshops, and um, I'd love to offer my services to you as well um, with uh, you know social media and um, curriculum development and anything else I might be able to help with with your, uh, with your school since you've been practical. And um, of course, I was working on only digital at that time, but obviously the whole idea of online teaching was very similar, and it's all kind of, you know, it's, it's the same ideas, it's just a different uh, a different gig. So he was like, uh, it's crazy you offer, because we're actually looking for someone with your skill set. We would need someone like you. So that led to networking out here more. Um, and again, I mean, getting to meet, you know, Stan Winston's son, that was, that was uh, again, sort of a, uh, an amazing opportunity, you know. 
uh, getting to network with, with through him and also meet other people. Um, you know, then of course learning about other uh, conventions like Monster Palooza, or then I got to um, finally like shake hands with John Rosengrant and Shane Mahan and, and many others who are um, just exceptionally talented people who were just heroes to me and have always been. Um, that that was just again just an amazing opportunity. Um, so I, I get a lot of questions from younger artists about, you know, well, how do you get started or what recommendations do you have for someone trying to get involved in the industry? And I mean, some of it is, um, well, I guess I, I always say there's kind of like three big kind of ideas or rules that I, I throw out there if I had to categorize something. And the first would be, um, be excellent at what you do, right? You have to be good at what you're trying to do and continually getting better um, because excellence is kind of the bar to entry, right? Uh, you're it, you know, in school, you might think your competition are your peers, but they're really not. Uh, your competition are the best in the world. If you want a job in this industry or in any industry that, that has a high um, skill set and uh, a lot of competition, you have to be able to stand out. And part of that is, um, of course, your work, right? Uh, so you have to be great at what you do. Um, that's a huge part. Next, of course, would be uh, be good with people. You know your soft skills, your ability to have a conversation, not just about what you can do, but about many other aspects of life, right? Um, many things that people can be agreeable on. That's that's important. So to be able to hold a good conversation, uh, just generally be likable. You know, <laughs> be a friendly person, be a positive person, um, and uh, just have good conversational skills. That's that's extremely important. Uh, knowing how to relate to many kinds of different people. Um, what else? Uh, and then I guess the third big one was kind of just luck, right? But luck in the sense that luck favors the prepared. Um, and in that phrase, I think that being prepared is the key. So, you know, uh, what is it? What luck is when it's um, skill and opportunity connect, right? Something like that. Uh, so, you know, if you have a good portfolio and you're good with people, all you're waiting for is the opportunity, right? The opportunity to have that elevator pitch, right? To have that moment where somebody who could hire you or give you a gig would say, hey, I've been looking for someone like you and I love your work, you know, or I had a great conversation with you. What do you do? Or yeah, whatever, you know, there's a million different ways that things can happen. But um, I think those are the three big factors that kind of played into my life. Um, and then just always, you know, your passion, your hard work, nothing can like, I love Schwarzenegger's um, ideas too of uh, uh, if you've ever listened to his speeches or read his autobiography, which I highly recommend as well. Uh, it's so important to um, to work hard, you know. I, there's no shortcuts to that, and of course, there may be, uh, especially in the digital realm. You know, we feel like sometimes we're cheating because we have the undo button, or we have, um, you know, many opportunities to uh, to uh, improve or quickly go about our uh, our work and expedite the process somewhat. But uh, I think you can only do that so much before. You know, you've got to have some of the fundamentals down. So being a good sculptor, um, having a good knowledge of, uh, of anatomy, of life drawing. Um, I'm so grateful that I double majored for my last year and a half in college because while the sciences are amazing, um, the hard sciences are hard and they are taxing. Uh, so my escape was uh, the arts. And so I double majored my last year and a half had no social life, um, just worked my ass off, fell asleep on my drawings, woke up, finished studying my anatomy, went to school, went to the ER, worked for a couple hours, like <laughs> seven, eight, 12, came back home, did the whole thing all over again. Uh, so I was really driven at that time, but also really conflicted because I didn't know what I was gonna do. I was like, I can't just do my art. I mean, I can't just do medicine and art at the same time. I've got to, I've got to pick one. Um, and so that's where eventually, uh, of course, art went out. So um, anyway, uh, so where are we going here on the journey? Um, and sorry, if anyone has any other questions, I only see one there, and then we've definitely got some viewers. So if anyone has any questions about anything, please fire away. Um, I'm just kind of going down my journey as to where <laughs> how I wound up here. Um, and I'm looking for this modifier on this brush. What are we looking at here? Uh, where is that curve function? twist it's twist yeah that's it all right it's getting some curly cues in here um anyway so uh i worked at sight and sound theaters which is this like giant theater 
so I was there while I was working with uh, the Stan Winston School. And there, they do like these massive biblical productions, like literally biblical. <laughs> um, and it's in a very Bible, Bible belty kind of area of Pennsylvania. So it's a pretty conservative area. And their productions are incredible. Like visually, physically, they are bigger than Broadway. And uh, they are pretty high quality. Like they push the limits on um, multi-screen projection and like rotating uh, treadmills with like motion tracking and, and it's just they do some really amazing stuff over there so I was really lucky again to uh, be hired as a ZBrush artist uh, and that's where I really got my feet wet um, again being paid to do one thing that I was efficient at um, skilled at but then also being paid to learn how to 3d print um, scale replicas of all the sets that we built for the stage that people would actually run on and utilize um, oh, sorry, what's this? Uh, let's see, question, how big is this print going to be? Uh, good question. Uh, I'm not exactly sure, but it's going to be big. Um, it'll definitely be multi-piece. Uh, and I'm thinking, I'll show you some of the reference that um, I hunted down a while back. So, uh, let's see here. So, uh, being the science nerd that I am, um, I really wanted to... Uh, use real cloud systems since I knew they were going for photorealism in Lion King and that is my jam I'm a huge photorealist uh, but I can do stylized too so this is what's called an anvil cloud storm system and I had conceived of the whole base so when I was working there I was talking with Mishi who's my art director and uh, Mishi McKegg and I was saying hey well so uh, they said to sculpt Bufasa and, and to give them something that would, you know, look like a lion in the clouds. And I said, well, what else, you know, is that it? And she's like, well, if you want a storyboard or, you know, we're open to anything. So I was like, well, hell yeah, I want to storyboard the scene because I have a lot of ideas. So um, I thought, well, let's encompass some real science and real meteorology and uh, blend it all together with this sort of supernatural fantasy element as well. So this uh, storm cloud system was, I knew what it was in my head, but it took a while for me to figure out like what it was called. And uh, so this, uh, this storm cloud system, our conversation with Mufasa and Simba was gonna happen um, down at this level. All right, so this is where we're at right now. Um, but then the way I was gonna have him um, leave, I guess the scene was that his mane was gonna flow upward and below high up into the uh, you know stratosphere and get high, so high that it would almost, break the curvature of the earth a little bit and start to catch the sunlight. So I thought this scene was going to be at night. I didn't realize we were going to do it in the like late afternoon, which is a bizarre turn of events. But um, so I figured how cool it would be to have like the dark kind of of night down here and the blue and then have this beautiful transition from the blues to the oranges, kind of like this photo at the peak of his mane. And then his mane would kind of pull his face into the clouds further and you kind of have this beautiful kind of passive, gentle uplifting motion of his face moving into the clouds and pulling out. Um, and I had storyboarded this whole thing. So what we're seeing here is just a, a, a very f small fraction of what I wound up finishing in, well, f like doing completely differently really in the end. This is similar to what I, what I did for NPC, but um, obviously those files are um, with them. But um, this is something I was working on at home just to kind of get my brain around like how would things look. And a lot of this stuff is too like whimsical, like you know, getting all these curls and wisps in here and things. There's, it was uh, not quite uh, what would work, but it's it's similar to what I was conceiving of. Um, so anyway, uh, sorry, so the original question was how big is this going to be? Um, I'm thinking maybe like, maybe two feet tall or, you know, around 18 inches, something like that. Um, you know, maybe a bit wider. Uh, I'm, I'm still trying to develop the idea, but um, I, I conceived of the idea. So in the beginning of The Lion King, in the original, um, Mufasa has that famous line where he's talking to Simba and he says, look at the stars, right? The dead kings of the past are in those stars. And blah, 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 you know, if you're ever feeling lonely, just think of them and you know, no, no, I'll be up there too. So I figured, all right, so he's pointing to the stars and there's not a cloud in the sky when he's pointing that out. And yet in the original, he comes back in the clouds and I'm like, there's no stars. <laughs> like they kind of forgot about that. Like what the heck? I mean, there are stars sort of in the negative space in the original when you see, you know, his um, silhouette kind of in the negative space around the clouds, within the clouds, but uh, you don't really have any connection to the stars. And so I'm like, we got to fix this. So my idea, the whole storyboard went um, essentially uh, the shot when Simba's at the lake and he's looking in the water and Rafiki says he lives in you. 
he touches the water, he sees Mufasa's face. And at that moment, then I designed this idea where you'd have a lightning strike happen in, from far away. So you'd have a lightning reflect first in the water, and then as the rumble of the thunder kicked in almost at the same time, you'd hear this echo of Simba, you know, just kind of off in the background. And that's when he looks up, and then in the original, because I didn't have any audio for this or anything, I just had like some animatics that was like, the original stuff that they had and then they said well just feel free to do what you said whatever come up with whatever you think like we're open to it so i uh i went ahead and, and then thought of this whole rest of the scenario so he looks up and says father and now he says dad i guess in this one um and uh the, the view was you look over the lake and you'd see this storm system kind of billowing with like a, almost a triangular peak kind of coming toward toward a symbol on the other side of the lake and uh this cloud system you know would be um something like this and you'd have many more clouds pulling out along the horizon but they're still kind of on the horizon so there wasn't filling up the entire sky because above the cloud line then you could see all the nebulas and the milky way and the galaxies and just beauty of space right just the night sky and shooting stars randomly here and there speckling the sky uh, but then there was one star you know in the upper right corner that was just extra bright and much brighter than the rest and then you'd hear again a rumble of thunder as there's a bit of lightning and storms happening kind of down here where the feet are. Of this, uh, this is an anatomy, an amazing uh, line anatomy, by the way, by an artist who I have to find her name. I downloaded this model a while back because uh, I saw this line anatomy because I'm a huge anatomist and my last name De Leon literally means of lion, so <laughs> I'm a huge lion fan. Um, let's see. Artist name. She is amazing, by the way. She was top row on Zebra Central a while back, and I'm sure she's done more stuff that's incredible too. But uh, let's see here, Zebra. Lion Anatomy. Uh, let's see. What is her name? It was like giving credit where credit is due. Um, I'm sure somebody might know. Uh, yes, I worked on Lion King Dexter. <laughs> Uh, it looks massive. We use FDM. No, I'm not going to use FDM. Actually, I think this is all going to be uh, SLA. So this will be um, uh, printed on the Form 3, I believe. Uh, I just got my Form 3 from Form Labs, and I am super excited to use it. Uh, the clouds look awesome. I generally struggle sculpting environments, so thanks for doing the stream. Oh, sure, man. Um, dude, you and me both, dude. I, I'm a character artist by nature. Um, I love animals in particular. I'm a huge animal lover. Uh, so, yeah, uh, clouds is not my 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 go-to idea <laughs> for sculpting anything. Um, but uh, yeah, um, it's uh, clouds are is, that's a unique challenge, man. I'll tell you that much. It was definitely uh, it's definitely intimidating. All right, so just to give credit for this uh, line anatomy. Um, Maria, that's right, that's her name. So this is, this is the model. If you want to support her, uh, you want to pick up her line model. It is gorgeous. Um, it's some really amazing work. Um, so I use this as a base to kind of work off of here. Uh, it's it's incredible stuff. Yeah. So I was more than happy to buy this. Um, but yeah, that's uh, that's her stuff. Uh, awesome work incredible stuff anyway um so that's this guy or girl right here and uh so using this as kind of a base to uh push all this out from and kind of get a uh nice lion looking head um so where was i um environment art yeah um i guess i'm a realist though so i, I try to go for realism um I guess clouds are just that, clouds are that weird in between though, right? Clouds are um, amorphous, clouds by their very nature are, uh, are they're, they're not, um, <laughs> they can look solid, they can look like mountains, and yet they also, it's, it's, such, a, it's such a strange thing to sculpt, I, it's, it's definitely, it's definitely challenging. Um, I think there are some sort of, as I developed this um, at NPC, it, it got a more refined look for sure, but um, I still don't feel like I have like a solid like this is it you know because we knew we'd all have to be done at Houdini and I was creating basically like a container for what the final form would look like um, oh so anyway I was explaining the whole scene the, the whole storyboard for uh, for what, what I envisioned so that shooting star I, I designed it so that 
when Simba hears his voice being called and then you hear it again, it was the, the star was essentially like Mufasa's soul. And that was like entering our atmosphere. And as it came down into the clouds, like a shooting star kind of rupturing through our atmosphere and then hitting this, this clouds, almost like a comet or a meteor, I had the lightning boil up from, from the base of the clouds at the, the tip of the storm and swell up to kind of almost have like a magnetic or chemical covalent kind of reaction with the soul. And it had this beautiful eruptive lightning kind of storm that pulled up from the ground up into the clouds. And then the soul almost using the clouds like a, um, a medium to manifest the soul or to kind of have something to show the soul or the figure with you know so the way like you need uh, like mist or, or steam or fog to see a laser beam when you have like you know a laser pointer passing through a distance of air uh, I figured that would be this cool explanation for why there's clouds forming Mufasa rather than just no oh, he's just in the clouds for no reason I mean this sort of added this level of logic and you know connection to everything uh, and also allowed it for it to be this really epic, beautiful scene. And so then once the soul hit the clouds and Mufasa kind of erupted or m morphed out of the clouds, and there was like this inner glow, almost like a literal star was inside of the clouds. Um, below it, I had the, uh, the lake kind of rippling and flowing with water, um, like uh, waves kind of emanating from the center of, uh, of where the star and where the storm was kind of um, hovering, sort of like the way a chopper a helicopter hovers over water. Um, I wanted these perpetual whip ripples in the oh, in the uh, lake, kind of like almost like a heartbeat or breathing. And it's really just this feeling of power and yet like gentle, the power under control. You know, which I think is like the most. That, that's such a beautiful embodiment of um, a godlike or loving father figure, where there's this incredible, you know, the, the, like the lion. He's such an incredible, powerful being, and yet also that power is under control and so that amplifies his compassion or gentleness right that level of um, strength under control I think and that shows this level of maturity you know and, and uh, power so anyway um, that was the design and the water kind of splashes hits the camera and Simba's mane kind of pushes back and you just feel this immense power and then then they went on to have their conversation and then I would cut to Simba's eyes and you'd see in one eye you'd see his father in the other eye you'd see the uh, lightning kind of reflecting from off in the distance and showing again like a visual metaphor of um, of a uh, kind of conflict, inner conflict, right? Because this is that watershed moment where Simba has to decide: is he going to go and live his hedonistic life, or is he going to, you know, stay, um, uh, or, or is he going to uh, move on to uh, you know take his place as king and do with his life as he should? Uh, so then the next scene is of course closer in Mufasa and then we get back to Simba and we kind of go through that back and forth we have a nice like side shot with the holy light kind of coming down on Simba and then one of the final shots I designed before you know it all wraps up was uh, was uh, Simba in one eye really emotional really sad look in his expression and tight on the eye where you could see this kind of cloud manifestation of Mufasa um, you know saying his goodbye and Simba saying no don't leave and that that reflection of literally the soul of the father reflecting in the windows to the soul of the son. It was like this kind of crazy, you know, metaphor, biblical, epic, emotional, you know, convergence of everything. And uh, the response I got was great. Uh, I really uh, am thankful just to have heard what, what um, John Favreau thought of it. Um, and it's just a bummer. We just didn't have enough time. The, the, the studio was just... Uh, Everyone was so busy, um, I guess, that uh, we just didn't have the time. I was brought in like the last month of production, unfortunately. Um, and so I think it was shared that they wished that they had known of me or that I was hired sooner. Um, but we just didn't have the time to implement it. So it's a real bummer because I, I guess what I wound up creating was way more complex than just um, a nice placeholder. <laughs> so it really wasn't able to be implemented uh, in time for the film, which was a real bummer for me. Super bittersweet. So it was nice to know everyone liked it who, who saw, you know, the final storyboards because everything was done like very photorealistically. Um, but there's just, you know, keyframes, just images um, and renders. Um, but uh, yeah, because it never made it to the film, I don't think it was ever included in um, any art of books or anything. So it's just kind of on the servers of uh, NPC sadly collecting dust <laughs> so I figured I'll try to try to complete my idea here and, and maybe I'll uh, I guess I'll probably gift uh, if I can get this to a good level I'll be more than happy to um, 
print it and give a gift to um, to John and uh, to Mishi and maybe a few others. Um, because uh, it was Mishi who called me up and said, hey, you know, we've got something and can you, you know, hop on an interview and can you send your work? And then brought me in and then finally it was just like, all right, it's Lion King. And I was just like, oh my God. <laughs> I, was, I was freaking out because it would have, I was so bummed when I heard they were working on the movie and I didn't know like where it was going to happen. Then I heard it was all London. So I figured, oh, I'm not moving to London. Um, so I didn't even bother applying once I knew what was going on. Um, but then I thought that opportunity had passed and then I got this call from Mishi out of the blue back in May and I was just like, wow, this is, this is awesome. So anyway, um, so that's kind of my, that's my, my Lion King story. <laughs> um, let's see, sorry, I'm missing some questions here. What do we got? Um, oh, wow, this is incredible. Thank you. Uh, just rewatched Mufasa's scene. I was expecting to see Mufasa in the clouds. I was just talking clouds in the film. Yeah, I know. It's kind of a bummer. Um, what are we attempting to create exactly? Uh, we're creating clouds and Mufasa in the clouds. <laughs> Zebra pawn, prawn? Zebra prawn on Twitch. Uh, yeah, so anyway, sorry, I'm not sure clouds are really not the most exciting thing, but I'll, uh, I'll move back here onto, uh, I'll move all back onto Mufasa's uh, face here. Um, yeah, so, um, Sorry, I just answered you. Yeah, no worries. Um, so if anyone has questions, uh, please let them rip. Uh, sorry, I don't have any like music or anything going on right now. It's uh, my first stream, and I know that there's like license-free music that people can can play. Uh, I just haven't uh, haven't had time to really jump into everything with uh, prepared for this as much as I'd like to. So next stream will be uh, <laughs> be even more fleshed out. I hope. Um, but yeah, so let's throw in some, uh, let's bring some stuff down here, kind of create a, it's like, you know, I feel like I want to create a base that's like the bottom of the clouds could be the base, but then when I think about that, that storm cloud system that I showed you, where's my reference? Um, this was found on Google, this thing. Um, I just think I love how there's like this tower of clouds down here at the bottom. They're kind of swooshing up and, uh, um, you know, every night I just designed this for the show. There was like, all this rain pouring down, so I'm, I've been thinking about having some rain kind of almost be the base, except then that creates like a V structure where it's super low. So I might even just have either like rain, a clear resin filling up the whole bottom here. Ah, I don't know. Or maybe I might just. I don't know. We'll, we'll figure it out. I don't know. I mean, I can just always. I can work modularly, so then if uh, one idea doesn't pan out, I can just jump onto another. Um, uh, let's see how long has this taken so far. Uh, it's hard to say, man. I mean, this was this was over uh, time when I got off work. I'd come home and I concept different pieces. Um, so this was hours. I mean, hours and hours. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, when you get an opportunity to work on such a huge film as Lion King, um, that's a kind of a once in a lifetime sort of opportunity. So I, I didn't really keep track of how long I worked on Elements when I came home, just a concept for myself, and then go back to NPC and kind of repeat the process. Um, I just I just worked until I passed out because <laughs> that was that was my only gig at the time. So I was full on, all in, um, you know, just really wanted to. Uh, just really wanted to give it my all because I was, uh, I was super, super excited. Um, let's see where we're going here. Uh, let's back this out a second. Definitely going to. Uh, I'm definitely going to try to create some internals here because uh, when I uh, when I did my um, Last Guardian Trico statue, um, I uh, 
taught myself some basic electronics. So I learned how to wire in LEDs, um, which for anyone who knows electronics, that's it's pretty simple stuff. But for someone who's never really, you know, dealt with electronics directly, I've only tangentially been aware of certain things thanks to my dad, because my dad was a uh, high-level electrical engineer. So things like LEDs and <laughs> lighting and that kind of stuff, he dealt with like massive systems of lighting for like companies like Merck and you know whatever. So. Uh, stuff like what I'm learning is basic to him and professionals like him but for me it was just like I was always just on the fringe hearing about stuff like that but uh, to teach myself electronics for uh, 3d print was it was pretty cool it's uh, something I've learned to do for myself when I want to learn something new or uh, um, I just have an idea for a project I, I learned to carrot myself so like the idea of like a, a horse and a carrot you have a carrot dangling on the end of a stick keep it in front of the horse uh, for me I just uh, I, I kind of do that to myself by thinking of um, you know what uh, what do I want to accomplish with the piece and then all right like I have this very elaborate idea and I don't limit my t myself to say um, I only know these things or I only have these tools or I only know how to do X so that's all I can do that's my only tool set like dude we live with the internet now like you can learn anything you want it's just if you have the time and the desire so I try to force myself to say, what do I want to do, period? Okay, now how do I get that done? And if it means I have to learn a new skill set, um, so be it, you know? I mean, of course, within practicality, if I have the, uh, the means to acquire said tools or said knowledge. Um, but usually the answer is yes. Um, so that's what I try to do. Uh, yeah, so, <laughs> thanks. Uh, for line space in the clouds, did you just draw a claw on top of the object and move around it? Try using some kind of stamping brush. Uh, have I tried using some kind of stamping brush? Oh, you mean like for textures? Um, uh, no, I haven't really. Um, I think I what I remember correctly, I haven't even I haven't even opened this file in months. Uh. I think I remember correctly. I used like I think I used noise. I think I used Noise Maker on this, yeah, to get some of this um, quick kind of like pitted sort of look. But it kind of looks like stone. Um, again, clouds are just this. That are just a weird thing. Um, so I'm going to do the best that I can to uh, to give it a more naturalistic kind of cloud feel. Um, <laughs> the sculpt is cool. Thanks, man. Uh, are you going to 3D print this? It looks awesome. Thanks, man. Uh, yeah, it's going to be 3D printed uh, for sure. Um, and again, right now, I mean, it wasn't that wasn't initially what I was doing for this. I was originally doing this as a concept just to get my my brain around how to sculpt clouds and how to make them look like Mufasa. But uh, uh, this is uh, something that will be. Um, it's going to have to go through a whole other process. So 3D printing stuff versus. Um, sculpting or modeling for visual effects are two entirely different uh, animals, no pun intended. Um, you've got to have your, your mesh be watertight, you can't have any open faces, you've got to think about real world physics, you've got to think about weight, um, and you've got to uh, you got to make it work, you know, you got to make it work in the real world, and uh, it's, it's easier said than done sometimes. Um, but I am all about pushing the boundaries and the limits. Um, one of my personal mottos is uh, possibilities, not limitations. So focus on the possibilities. Don't, because so many people, I think, defeat themselves before they even get started with a project or a, you know, a, uh, a pursuit in life. I think a lot of people just uh, give up too early or never try X, Y, or Z just because uh, they defeat themselves. They think, oh, well, it's never going to happen for me, or I'll never get blah, blah, blah done. Uh, and if you think that way, then guess what? You're not going to succeed unless, <laughs> unless there's somebody really looking out for you, and they really want you to have an opportunity. So you have to, I think, approach life with the idea of, well, what could be possible? Uh, obviously, within the realm of... I don't, I don't know. Even, I don't even want to say within the realm of, of reality because uh, you know sometimes it's not. It doesn't seem realistic to think uh, I could accomplish something like blah blah blah. Whatever you're looking to do. Uh, so I think you have to dream big, and then you have to at least try. You have to attempt. You know, I mean, if you don't have the cojones to even try something, then you're never going to achieve it. So you got to try. You got to be willing to fail. That's that's always uh, something that has to be, um, you know, 
something you're ready to do. You have to be willing to fail, you have to be willing to try. And uh, so when it comes to 3D printing, uh, I, I didn't think like sculpting and well, printing wings would be possible with feathers, but um, give an example here. Uh, this is a uh, this is a wing. This is broken because I've taken this to trade shows. But this was printed on the Form Three. Let me see. Uh, make sure this is showing up on camera right. So this is printed on the Form Three. Um, and this is one of the wings of my Trico statue. And I'm not sure if this will pick up the detail or not, but you can actually see. Uh, striations in the wings and the uh, feathers themselves um you know next trade show you if you find me at some uh, trade show and you see this you know feel free to touch it uh i'll see if uh if anyone's going to see es i'm going to see if form labs can print up um, some more of these and have them for you guys to uh, check out if you're going um but yeah the resolution the detail you can get on the uh, form labs printers on sla is is bananas it's it's incredibly fine so again, that's just looking at possibilities, right? Looking at your potential to do something, whether or not you know you can do it for sure, who knows, but I tried and it worked. So that was pretty cool. Um, do you use a resin printer or FDM? Yeah, resin. Well, I use both. Um, I have uh, a MakerBot and I have a uh, Ultimaker on loan from uh, Ultimaker, um, which I have to actually send back soon. Uh, but uh, yeah, they both have their strengths and their weaknesses and um, if I had to pick one, though, I'd probably, I mean, I shouldn't say probably, I would definitely go with Form Labs. Um, it's just, uh, for a while, I would say probably because there is, uh, in the past, there was a more uh, durability issue, I would say. Like FDM, you could sort of drop and throw around and have less chance of really being worried about it breaking. But now with tough resin and elastic and all these other options, um, FDM versus SLA, um, FDM's cheaper. Uh, but the quality you get is also reflective of that. You, you just It's really hard to get um, exceptional quality out of FDM. I mean, I've been able to get some pretty great stuff out of it, out of my MakerBot. So you can push you can push FDM printers pretty far, actually. But still, um, when it comes to a pinpoint of laser light and photopolymer resin versus, uh, uh, versus uh, you know, layer thickness of FDM machines, uh, there's really no contest um, when it comes to detail. Uh, but again, each each has their uh, their applications. You know, I think that there's um, you can definitely find um, great usages for both. Um, <laughs> funny story, I remember uh, it was probably one of the I don't know maybe the second year or third year I was here in LA. I, I, li I moved to LA only like uh, five and a half years ago. Um, I had my uh, had my 3D printer. My uh, at that time I only had the uh, MakerBot replicator too. I had that shipped out to me from Pennsylvania, and uh, I was giving my dog a bath. I have a corgi, and uh, in our apartment, there's a um, uh, the toilet is very close to the uh, to the bathtub. So I was in between the toilet and the bathtub, you know, scrubbing my dog and, and washing him up, and uh, and then I uh, I think I had a pair of jeans on and a belt around that, and so then the belt, the back of my belt, and I stood up. Uh, caught the lip of the toilet seat and it ripped, I stood up so quick, it ripped off the hinge, the plastic hinge on one side of the uh, toilet seat. And so then I was like, oh man, I gotta go to Home Depot and buy another toilet hinge. And then I'm like, wait a second, I got a 3D printer. Somebody is, has to have this file on there that you can just print it and replace it. Literally 15 minutes later, I was printing and finishing a hinge <laughs> to put on my toilet to replace the one I broke. I'm like, dude, the practicality of, of uh, printers, it's its pretty cool. I mean, there's so many things that, you know, you can make at home now um, that you wouldn't have to go to the store for, you know. I mean, granted, there's a lot of stuff you can't do with it too, but uh, for simple, you know, single material objects, uh, you know, it's pretty incredible. You can do some, some pretty amazing things. Um, Practical prints are amazing. Yes, they are. Uh, let's see, Pixelogic got a question. Have you looked into the Elego Mars Pro? Par of the Form One feature in terms of what is resin prints? Huh. Mr. Square Peg uh, at Pixelogic. So I'm assuming you're asking that of Pixo. Uh, yeah. So I guess I'll leave that to them. What else do we got here? What are your views on LCD-based resin printers? Ah, yeah. Um, 
Uh, oh, asking that to me. Okay, cool. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to go back quick. Uh, got a question. Have you looked into the Elegu, Elegu Mars Pro? Uh, I haven't looked into it, so I guess I can't really give you a educated opinion. <laughs> um, uh, I've seen other you know, resin printers, um, but truthfully, I've yet to see something that really competes with the level of professionalism and predictability uh, of Form Labs printers. They are uh, an incredible standard now, and that's not because you know I'm an ambassador with them. I mean that doesn't really. Um, I mean they're not like paying me or anything, you know, to say this. It's uh, I, I just love to be partners with them because I love their printers and I love to do what I can with them. Um, I've used an LCD based resin printer, so you're talking about like uh, like DLP kind of printers where they basically flash a solid image, and that creates one layer instantly the whole layer at once rather than like a laser which draws out the shape which you know over time that amounts to a lot more time than like bam one layer bam another layer bam that's how like the uh, LCD printers work um, I've just seen how when you get really close you can see the detail um, versus one or the other so LCD based printers um, if I have the choice if money's not an object just go with a form labs printer uh, if you can get a DLP printer. I mean, you can if speed is more important to you than resolution, you know. Then yeah, I guess a DLP printer, an LCD printer, would be uh, would be an option. Um, but I'm I'm biased, but I'm biased because their quality is is awesome. <laughs> so uh, you created a Voltron Blue Lion '80s. Uh, I printed it. Can get it as a kid. I've never modeled. I'd never modeled a Voltron, but uh, I'm aware of it. I used to have a um, when I was a little kid. I used to have a uh, <laughs> a big wheel that was uh, a Voltron. <laughs> so if you guys remember, it's like a tricycle, like a big wheel. Uh, yeah, because I'm an '80s kid, man. I was uh, I'm 37, so I was born in '82, and I feel like I entered into the world at one of the most absolute golden ages of entertainment uh, that human history has ever known. <laughs> Uh, the 80s and 90s were by far still, I think, the most, and I think we're coming around to a new era, I think, at least technologically, but I think for now, still, 80s and 90s, man, late 80s to early 90s were the epitome of uh, innovation and, uh, and uh, experimentation in filmmaking. Uh, I don't know why, but my brain, I remember because George Duchel, he a uh, sculptor, he was, he was doing his podcast and he was talking about... Um, the thing, for instance, and uh, I remember he would he he apparently has a similar view too. I think we the eighties especially, man, but like eighties and nineties. It's just there's such a level of um, I just think of the thing because of like all the puppeteering and the animatronics and just they're just really experimental and crazy and just it was just wild. I mean, it's it's as a story, it's you know whatever. It's 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 a great fun horror action you know movie, but. Uh, Still, for me, like the high watermark would be Jurassic Park, right? Like just uh, incredible marriage between CG and, and animatronics. Um, the, who else? Oh, it costs like two ninety nine. Well, then, dude, yeah, if it's like three hundred bucks, get it. <laughs> Try it out. The Mars Pro, that is. Yeah, okay. Yeah, dude, three hundred bucks. That's uh, that's a pretty big difference than thirty five hundred. So, go for it. Um, yeah. You know, again, it's it's. Uh, I mean, to a degree, you can take this with a grain of salt, but as with anything, uh, when it comes to uh, an artist and his tool, uh, it's not about the tool so much as it is about the artist. So if you have a decent tool, uh, you should be able to do some decent work, you know? Uh, but it's more about if you have the vision for what you want to do. Um, if you have some great ideas, uh, you know, it, it's... Look at, uh, I mean, I'm sure Da Vinci would draw something amazing, whether he had like a burnt stick on a cave wall or if he had a Cintiq with all the digital elements. You know, it, it's in the end, um, you got to learn to use what you got and maximize it, push it to the furthest it can. Uh, and then eventually, you know, I think if you work hard, someone will take notice, hopefully, if you again position yourself and talk to the right people and smile, shake hands, kiss babies. <laughs> You'll eventually, uh, you'll you'll strike somewhere down the line where someone will say, "Hey, I've noticed your work. I like it. Um, how would you like to work on Project X?" And that's when you say, "Thank you very much. I will take it." <laughs> uh, 
and then use that money and feed it back into your artistic future and at least that's how I've operated you know it's you invest everything that you make um, I shouldn't say everything you should save uh, of course too you should be financially responsible but uh you should reinvest your uh, your your funds man if, if you if art is your life then whatever it helps you become a more efficient artist a better artist um, lets you expand your skill set lets you experiment lets you have fun and innovate and create and explore your ideas um, I think that's worth the time and money it takes to earn it uh, and that's what you should do uh, so yeah buy that $300 printer uh, practical effects uh, <laughs> didn't like Judge Dredd huh yeah, yeah. I wasn't that big a fan either uh, one more question UV resin is toxic. Um, UV resin is toxic. Well, yeah, I mean, well, you don't want to eat it, so it's toxic in that sense, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, so, <laughs> you know, and you don't really want to get it on your skin, um, that's for sure. Some people can develop allergies to UV resin, so that's why they advise you to wear gloves and use tools and to come into little skin uh, resin contact as possible. So, uh, yeah, don't, uh, don't go dipping your hand in UV resin. Uh, cured resin, um, not that I'm aware of. I mean, it's, it's, I, I believe it's rather, uh, rendered rather, um, neutral, um, when it's cured. I think maybe if some people have sh extreme allergies, maybe some people, you know, I mean, almost anybody can be allergic to almost anything these days. So, uh, you know, um, I'm not going to say that cured resin couldn't have some sort of, um, you know, reaction with someone's skin, but, uh, you know, just, uh, don't touch it. <laughs> Do the best you can not to touch it, uh, when it's not cured. If it's cured, I mean, it should be fine, but you can also, um, coat it. Um, you know, you can do, like, a nice, uh, either clear gloss, UV protective gloss, um, would probably be wise, I would say. Um, you know, so that you can finish up your, uh, you can finish up your, uh, 3D prints in a way that will be uh, it will be uh, safe to handle for sure. Um, yeah. Oh, okay, so they're talking about the raw liquid form. You're saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and sorry, I'm reading the chat here, and it's feeding all these different areas from different, uh, you know, Twitter. I mean, Twitter. Excuse me, <laughs> Twitch, Facebook, um, YouTube. So uh, for those on Facebook or YouTube. Um, Someone on Twitch was just asking about UV resin. Um, yeah. So. Let's see. Got the stuff from Dynamesh. Yeah. All right. Let's get this guy. That's the one cool thing and the uh, fun thing about working in 3D printing, when you know what your end goal is um, overall, topology does not really matter. Uh, so that's the joy of Dynamesh is you can just, you can just re-Dynamesh to your heart's content until you're satisfied with your, uh, with your sculpts and It's so much more fun in a lot of ways, I think, than, uh, I mean, there's reward, too, in, in working in VFX as well. I mean, there's a, it's, it's, there's just two different animals, but, you know, working, um, working on a film and creating an asset that's incredibly well modeled efficiently and has clean UVs and has a brilliant texture and great materials, that's, that's all really satisfying for sure, but there's also, it's just a different level of, just playfulness and fun when you're working with 3D printing that you can uh, you just not have to worry about topology um, as long as it's sealed and decimated and you don't have any like weird holes or backwards normals you know you're good to go and it's just knowing then it's you know there's other challenges you have to know how to like orient your print right and uh, you know all that fun 
stuff. But uh, we'll see, maybe in the next stream or two down the line here, uh, I can walk some of you guys through a bit of that process of uh, preparing your models for 3D printing. Give you guys a little preview of, uh, I got a course on Nomen. It's called Mastering 3D Printing for the 3D Artist. So if any of you guys out there just wanna dive in, if you haven't learned how to 3D print or prep your models, um, if you hop onto the Nomen Workshop and just Google or search in there, um, Mastering 3D Printing, you'll find my course and it will walk you through. If you know ZBrush, it will take you from that all the way down to preparing your model for any type of printer you want to work in overall. Do, 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 do. Let's see here, questions. No problem, I do take your time. <laughs> Uh, Nintendo, Sony, or Microsoft? Um, all of them, man. I just I love video games. I love great games. So any good game on any platform I'm a fan of. But if I had to pick one, uh, PlayStation wins for sure. This last round, man, PlayStation 4 was where it's at. They had some incredible games. Uh, I'm all about a good story, too. I really do not care for multiplayer anything anymore. I think when I was younger and I had more time just to burn and I was still figuring life out and what I wanted to do with my time in my life, I mean, yeah, multiplayer was a thing. You know, Halo, for sure, with friends. <laughs> Call of Duty, uh, Gears of War, especially the first one. Oh my gosh, those are my jams. But now, I, I, I guess I like story-driven content because I know it has a beginning, middle, and end games. And uh, I want... I want an interactive, immersive, emotional experience that's intelligent and that will surprise me um, and move me in some way. And I don't know. I, I guess that's just the filmmaker in me. That you know, that's that's what I'm working toward right now. And my life is really making my first short film, and, and then moving on from there um, to really just do films. That's what I really want to do. Um, you know, because I believe that I, you know, I feel like that's what I was born to do almost. And that's that's not hyperbolic or anything it's just um i think certain people just know what they're really passionate about and what they're supposed to do and um you know putting my money where my mouth is and just been working hard on assembly and all this stuff for that um but uh yeah so story driven man story driven content games yeah um you know last guardian is probably my number one game of all time now but uh you know, other games, ironically similar name. The Last of Us was another great game. Um, the Uncharted series, they're awesome. Um, man, oh, Until Dawn, if you want to talk about, like, a mashup of everything we just talked about. 80s kind of thriller horror teen. <laughs> like, teens in the wood cabin, you know, in the, in the wooden cabin. That uh, Until Dawn, that game is, for a horror game, it's like kind of like Resident Evil. It's like kind of locked off cameras, sort of, and very creepy and like the creature design man like and normally I don't find humanoid creatures that scary anymore I, I just don't really feel just, I guess I'm kind of annoyed with the I mean that's just kind of over the human form <laughs> to some degree because uh, we see ourselves all the time and I guess having worked in medicine and just done tons of life drawing and human anatomy is beautiful and amazing but I'm also just like if something looks like a humanoid overall I'm like eh I think aliens did it the best uh, but then I saw the Wendigo in Until Dawn and God damn, those things are creepy because they move like insects, but they have these elongated limbs and these crazy fangs and like these like kind of uh, like cataract eyes, like these milky. Oh man, they were just. They should make only for the sake of just more people experiencing th that horror story and those creatures. I think they should make a feature film out of uh, Until Dawn. It had Remy Malik in it too, amongst some other uh, known actors. So he was in there before he really blew up, and uh, they did a really good likeness of him too for uh, for that time. I mean, like, they nailed it. So if you're a gamer and you've never played Until Dawn, I highly recommend it if you're uh, into scary games. Uh, what else? Let's see, questions. Uh, uh, uh. Uh, FDM printers, the artillery, 3D genius is an amazing printer. It's one of those printers that can come 90% assembled. Gotcha. Love it. Can I give a link to... Oh, the course. Yeah, 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 sure. Uh, let me see here. Uh, 
seconds. Now, I'm going to be updating this course um, in the near future because I was waiting for my Form 3 to arrive so I could update it with the Form 3. Um, so that being said, uh, this is still 100% useful now, but it will be uh, better <laughs> and improved. Uh, and when I say soon, that's like who knows exactly when, but uh, months from now. I'm thinking sometime in 2020. But in the meantime, if anyone wants to get started, if you've got an FDM or an SLA 3D printer, this is the course for you. Um, and it's not the best photo. I was working full time at Pixelmondo when uh, <laughs> this was going on, so I trusted uh, No One Workshop to take. Uh, take photos of my stuff but this was a challenge this is a, a funny little dolphin character from a VR video game that's still in development but I worked uh, on it for a while and it's called Classroom Aquatic it's a very funny innovative cute ridiculous uh, brilliant game uh, I think there's a demo app for it and I'm sure you can find videos of uh, a lot of people playing it um, but it's uh, essentially you're a um, exchange student in a school of dolphins so of course the dolphins are geniuses and you're not so you have to cheat off their tests so you actually have to lean in vr you have to lean over and look at your fellow classmates tests to answer the multiple choice questions on yours <laughs> and of course there's a monitor teacher dolphin that's patrolling the classroom right and each each classroom has a different kind of teacher dolphin and they all have their own personalities it's really funny um, and you have like a set of uh, rubber erasers that you can pick up and throw across the room to like distract her. So when she's not looking or he's not looking, you throw your rubber eraser and hit like a, a globe on a shelf like across the room or you nail one of your dolphin classmates and then they'll squawk and be like, Mah! you know, <laughs> freak out. Then the teacher will come over and talk to them. And while she's distracted, you can be like, oh, I'm going to go now. I can see on their test, see what the answers are to problem A or C. It's, it's yeah, it sounds horrible in the sense of it's like, you know, people think, oh my god, are you teaching kids to cheat? No, it's just in jest. It's all good fun. And also, the test questions are real questions, but they're so advanced and hard. And questions meaning they're multiple choice questions of, like, who is the emperor of this country in this obscure time in history? Or, you know, what, what are the, I don't know, it's just like all kinds of real science or history or world questions. Like, just tons of very advanced like if you don't have a phd or a master's in these degrees and these topics you're not going to know the answers to these questions most likely so anyway uh the game is hilarious um i don't know when it's coming out uh, i know they've they've had a lot of uh a lot of bumps in the road but it'll get done eventually um so this is that main this is one of the main dolphins this is like this, the base model of their your classmates so i 3d printed this guy from the game um and so i kind of walk you that process of like what i what i'm doing here basically um, if you want to create a 3D print of a video game character or a movie asset, um, you know, or a visual effect asset, anything like that, um, this will walk you through that process. So I can teach you how to take any model that's uh, in 3D and how to prepare it so that you can actually hold it in your hand in the end. Um, so let me see how I enter this link. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. For those who haven't, there you go. Haven't looked it up. Uh, sorry, I've been missing some of the questions here. Um, yeah, Windows PC, you can play Xbox exclusives. Yeah, or you can just uh just buy each system. <laughs> uh, this is true. Also, X Cloud is amazing. Um, even preview Stadia is a joke. Yeah, Stadia is a joke. Uh, for what I hear. Um, makes PlayStation the obvious choice. Yep. Uh, but I have all the systems because I'm, I'm a huge fan of just, I want great stories. I want great interactive experiences. So um, I wound up just buying everything kind of when I can, you know, a Switch, Xbox One, PS4. Um, now I built this crazy PC, so I just got to get a Vive. And Form 3 Hype, yes, sir. Uh, VR games are fun. Yeah, are you excited for the, yeah, the new Half-Life game? Hell yeah, guys. I heard about that tomorrow at 10 a.m. I'm looking forward to learning about Half-Life Alex. Um, God, I've been waiting for... I'm a massive Half-Life fan. Uh, I loved Half-Life since the first game came out. Whatever it was, like 96, 90-something? 90 yeah, 96, I think. Dude, Half-Life is awesome. Uh, Half-Life 2, Half-Life 2, Episode 2. Holy shit. Um, just 
phenomenal storytelling, uh, and the games hold up today. Like you could play any one of those today, and it's still really fun and exciting. Um, oh, new Half-Life game. Oh yeah, people don't know. Yeah, there's a new Half-Life game coming out in VR. It's gonna be amazing. Uh, let's see. Half -Life. Alex, Google it. Yeah. Um, yeah, man, get a VR headset. Um, that's gonna make me buy a VR headset, by the way. Like I haven't bought one for my PC, but I have one for my PS4. Uh, I also just haven't bought one for anything other than PS4 because it feels like there's just not a lot of AAA titles out there that are, uh, you know, AAA titles for VR. Uh, there's just a lot of experiences or experimental films, which are cool, but doesn't really compel me to spend a lot of money on a headset just for that. Uh, but PS4, because they already have, you know, they got me with the system and once I heard there was a Last Guardian VR, I was like, oh yeah, <laughs> I need to experience that. So, um, but no, it was um, it was uh, Resident Evil 7. That's what made me buy a, a PSVR headset because I'm a huge Resident Evil fan. Um, I love the original games and uh, the remake of 1 was amazing. Now remake of number 2 is jaw-dropping, beautiful, incredibly realistic, um, phenomenal game. Love it. Um, let's see what other questions we got here. Uh, do, 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 do. Uh, I'm not sure, uh, Adam, you're asking when you feel like checking news on TVs, what's your trusted source channel? Um, oh, you mean like news, news, like real life news. Um, I don't watch TV, and uh, you want to talk about news, um, I think every news source is kind of biased, and I, I don't really want to get into news or politics, um, but I would say if you want truth, find people on the ground, like on YouTube, who are actually, <laughs> I mean, people are biased, period, but I, I don't really trust um, major news networks anymore. I don't really watch TV. Um, everything I got through the internet, streaming, um, yeah, I, I'd rather see people actually at real places and events and just simply give me the facts. I don't want to hear bias. I want to hear facts. I feel like journalism's dead. <laughs> if you want to know my strong opinion on that, uh, I think journalistic integrity is dead. Uh, at least the official journalists. I don't really trust any of them. Um, let's see. $180 on Amazon. Are you guys talking about headsets? Uh, getting the Valve Index or something else. Uh, am I getting the Valve Index or something else? Uh, yeah, I just heard about the Valve Index only like yesterday. So uh, whatever the best headset is for that experience, I'll pick up, I guess. Um, everyone's been telling me a Vive, but I guess the Index is kind of like a newer Vive. Um, that's a good question. I'm not really sure. But I guess HTC Vive or, or the Index, whichever whichever's best. Um, uh, I get my news from chat. Okay. Uh, go to rallies yourself when you can, yeah. <laughs> cool. Uh, all right, anyway, sorry guys, was uh, chatting it up here for a while, so I'll keep going with this sculpt. Um, but yeah, keep the questions coming, man. Do not get the Vive Cosmos. Uh, tracking is bad, gotcha. Yeah, I've got some friends who are, um, who are definitely knowledgeable of uh, a VR headset, so I'll probably confer um, with them. Uh, and uh, Nick, if you're watching, you know who you are. Uh, I'll probably have to talk with you about what headset to get. Um, Nick is a former uh, boss of mine and friend. We worked together at PDP. Uh, PDP, he hired me to work there. Um, PDP is uh, Performance Design Products. They are known for like game peripherals, and uh, I did a lot of work with them for Disney, um, for um, cleaning up and and preparing for 3D printing and um, sculpting or resculpting um, uh, work for um, Disney. Um, uh, man, blank it right now. The words uh, Disney products, consumer products. There we go. DCP, Disney Consumer Products. Yeah, so did a lot of work on uh, on stuff for them. Uh, there and so anyway, Nick uh, being a senior guy, he was actually it, Nick is a great guy, but he has some some amazing stories and experiences. One of the cool things I always thought about with him was uh, he's actually in the background in Back to the Future. He's uh, in the uh, 
if I remember correctly, I think it's in the behind the scenes footage, especially you can see him clearly as a, as a younger man. He's uh, in the background there as like a kid, I guess, a teenager. Um, in, uh, in Back to the Future, when Marty, when uh, Michael J. Fox walks into the diner and, uh, you know, has that confrontation with Biff. And, uh, yeah, Nick is in there. So anyway, uh, Nick is, Nick, it's just, you know, that's the thing. God, I love living in L.A. for this reason alone because I'm such a, I'm a film fanatic and uh, I really love being involved with, uh, you know, getting to meet the people that I'm a fan of, getting to shake their hand, getting to have meaningful conversations with them, getting to run into people who, um, you know, who can share these amazing stories or tell me about their experiences or um, getting to meet my heroes. Uh, you know, they always say never meet your heroes. Uh, I beg to differ because I've been lucky enough for all the people I admire or, um, you know, have been a fan of in some way when I was younger. They've all been great. I, I've, I've been really lucky or blessed, I guess, to be a fan of people who have been really, really great people and uh, really kind and generous and gracious. Um, but anyway, uh, Nick was just telling me about his experiences. But he's he and I worked together at PDP, and um, and uh, yeah, we just uh, we had a great time uh, working together and became fast friends. Um, he's another great guy who uh, I wound up spending like Thanksgiving with him like multiple years in a row um, because often um, I typically go home mostly for Christmas. So uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, Nick's a great guy, and uh, he's uh, a VR buff. So I'll probably confer with him about what the uh, the choice VR headset is to get here in preparation for uh, the next amazing Half-Life experience. Um, a couple friends of mine were like, they had friends at Valve, and they were like, I, I can't tell you what they were doing, but you should just go work there. You should go work there. Because they knew how big of a fan I was of, uh, or am of Half-Life. And I was like, dude, I don't know. I don't want to leave LA. I love the weather. And, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, Seattle... I actually have never been, but I've always thought, like, maybe I'll retire there. And I thought, maybe I'll retire working at a place like Valve, or actually working at Valve, because I was always intrigued how they're uh, very extremely intelligent about how they look for people that have interdisciplinary or cross-disciplinary um, minds, right? So people who, like myself and others, who come from different backgrounds, whether it's science or art or engineering or math or whatever, and they kind of have this unique convergence between a skill that seems like random or uh, you know not applicable to games, and then like psychology, right? But of course, there's an obvious connection there, and then and then yeah, game manufacturer development, uh, and they always wind up hiring just really brilliant, cool people. And not to to think that I'm any of those things directly, but I love to think and I love a good mental challenge and I love implementing intelligence into entertainment. That's why I'm such a huge fan of Michael Crichton because it's, he kind of was like the grandfather, the father of like the techno thriller, right? Uh, and uh, I just, I love films that do not treat the audience like an idiot. I love films that make you think that are, um, you know, decidedly intelligent films. Um, I don't know if you can see it, but that Matrix poster, it's a, uh, one of my favorite films. Uh, if I had to pick three, I'd say The Matrix, Jurassic Park, and uh, Interstellar are probably my top three films. But then there's like Back to the Future, Indiana Jones, Last Crusade. Um, I love just really huge, powerful adventure stories. That's uh, that's my jam. It's my taste. Um, that's what I want to make. Uh, questions. Um, I'm not sure, Adam, are you asking me PC or Mac? Um, I don't know, I'm kind of a fan of both, but I, I use a PC now, only because they're, um, I actually, I use this, of course, at, at home, but then I also just picked up a new, um, a Wacom Mobile Studio Pro. Uh, so the new Wacom Mobile Studio Pro 16 is pretty awesome. It's basically a Cintiq, like a 16-inch Cintiq with a full Windows PC built into the back of it. So, you know, uh, for a long time I was wanting, uh, I was a Mac guy, um, like since college, but uh, Mac has, I gotta say, since Steve Jobs passed away, personal opinion, they have not been innovating as, as revolutionarily as they were, is that a word, revolutionarily? They haven't been innovating in, in these giant leaps forward um, the way that they were when Steve Jobs was around. and. Uh, it's really sad because I was like their biggest fan and now I feel like they're just incrementally improving the iPhone and they, I'm sure they've got their game plan for like the next 
decade or two, and it just feels like, oh, slightly better camera, slightly new feature, this or that, and they're charging an arm and a leg for each one. I'm just like, dude, I've still got my iPhone 6S Plus. <laughs> I like my headphone jacks. I'm old school, I guess. I don't know. I, it's, I don't want more things that are, I mean, wireless is nice, but at the same time, it's just something else to charge, and I don't know, you can get interference. Uh, I just, I like, you know, as annoying as a cable can be, because I live with my headphones on, so not these, but like earbuds. I'll walk around all the time, and if I'm walking around, if I'm working from home, and I walk past the doorknob, you know, I'm sure you guys have had this too, your phone's in your pocket, or your iPod's in your pocket, you got your cable hanging around your face, or whatever, your body, and then you walk past the doorknob, and it yanks on the, well, yanks on the cable, and then you, your pods get plucked out of your ears, and you're like, damn it. <laughs> so, there is a convenience to not having wires, for sure, but, uh, I don't know, I'm still a fan of just the, the quality of sound you can get from that, and uh, I just, I don't know. Um, I don't know. I, plus, I'm not. I don't know. It's. It, I'm not a conspiracy theorist or anything. Cause like, who? You know, people are like, oh, I don't want my face scanned all the time or this or that. And I'm like, who's gonna? Who, who's most people? Who cares? Like, you know, the CIA is not gonna scan your face and use it for anything. But at the same time, I'm like, eh, I don't like my face being scanned all the time. <laughs> Although today with photogrammetry and with uh, cameras everywhere, I guess it's it's sort of like, you got. I, I honestly too, I operate in life with the idea that if the government wants to listen to anything I say or do or any of that, they're going to do it. So it's just like, you know, it really kind of, I don't know, I guess in the end it really doesn't matter because if they want to find out information about you, they can. Uh, you just got to live your life as if uh, you have nothing to hide because they can find out whatever they want. Um, <laughs> so there's there's my conspiracy theory uh, uh, joke for the night, I guess. I don't know or whatever. Um, what do we got going on? Questions. Alright, dude. It's getting late where you're at. I got you, Mr. Square Peg. Peace out. Have a good night. Uh, I hate it when my wireless headphone battery dies. Yeah. I'm not walking. Yeah, right? It's, uh, it's a catch-22. You get immense freedom, but then you also get limitation on, uh, on your battery life. See, that's the thing. It's like, once we get the battery thing figured out, we're you can have like a watch size battery last for a year <laughs> in full usage, you know, or at least like six months, even a month. That'd be awesome. You know, you don't have to charge something for the, like there's something that's very cool because it's minimal input, like my uh, wireless keyboard. I got a Bluetooth keyboard that I work with, with my um, Wacom uh, mobile studio. And uh, that thing, I forget to charge. I forget it needs charging because it lasts so long. So I got a Logitech uh, keyboard, this one. This thing is awesome, by the way. Um, definitely not paid to say any of this. I'm just such a huge fan, but like it's got nice LEDs. It's like super thin, uh, amazing Bluetooth. You got like three configurations for it. So you got like three different settings. You can have three different Bluetooth devices. Um, it rocks, really low profile. Uh, that thing doesn't need to be charged for months and I use it like daily. So that's like, I don't know. I guess they got like a really badass lithium ion battery in there and it's just, tiny little keystrokes, I guess, so there's really, I guess it just doesn't eat up a battery very much. Um, but yeah, the battery thing needs to be figured out. Like, I think once that's figured out, the world will be a better place. <laughs> Plus, like, making batteries and all that's kind of, uh, batteries are so toxic. It's, uh, how do you dispose of them? How do you recycle them? Like, uh, I think we need to get that figured out, too. What do we got? Questions? Uh, what else we have? I think batteries are the next innovation that will need to happen. Yeah, for sure, dude. Dexter, yep. Um, just like rendering. You know, this is something that guys are, that the my guys at my office at work, we were talking about this, and it's it's pretty amazing. Like, I just got an RTX card for this uh, PC. Uh, I just built the whole thing, like, a couple, like, a month or two ago. Um, and, yeah, RTX is nuts. It's awesome. Uh, and it's just it's real-time rendering like do I'm, I'm probably gonna do as much as I can in unreal now uh, We're doing that at work like just working exclusively in unreal. It's awesome and uh, almost exclusively like Maya unreal whatever, but uh, unreal is um, Unreal is incredible uh, the real-time ray tracing now is 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 really just coming into its own I think but just as so what we were talking about at work specifically is um Back in the day, uh, a computer that was basically like a giant calculator, literally, took up an entire room, right? It was this massive, 
massive pieces of machinery and like magnetic tape and whatever right and then we come into this era now and what takes up a room is a render farm right but we're now just leaving that and what used to take up a room for rendering is now taking up one box right real-time rendering eventually i think it's gonna they'll figure it out enough to the point where i you know i think uh you know rendering with a render farm will just be ancient you know probably sooner than later maybe in the next five years or so um and then you'll just have all these massive amounts of machines that are uh useless you know just these huge rooms filled with uh filled with hardware that's uh antiquated and needs to be recycled um I think what would be really truly revolutionary revolutionary would, would be to design hardware that once it becomes obsolete it can be repurposed or recycled so you design it with the intention with the knowledge like we should know better by now like why create more trash right why create more plastics that are not recyclable when you have the option not to, right? Like, why not use, like, hemp plastic? Like, <laughs> uh, if anyone watches Joe Rogan, he was going off about that with uh, another director who I've been lucky to meet, um, Luis Ahoyas, director of The Cove. If you guys haven't seen The Cove, you should watch it. Or Racing Extinction, it's awesome, too. Um, he was going on about hemp plastic, right? I mean, you can make plastic out of almond. You can make plastic out of soy. So, like, I, I don't know. All this to say, I think, uh, as a tangent to uh, all this... Um, people can start working designing with the intention or the knowledge that everything will become obsolete and there'll be a better product down the line why not design with that in mind from the beginning so that you don't just have to trash what you're using but instead uh you know you can design with the intention of it being recycled fully you know or upgraded or just somehow reduced to its components in a way that can be efficiently disposed of or environmentally friendly so that it you know, if it doesn't wind up in a landfill, that it, it's it's just, you know, and I know, I mean, there's so many complications to that. The rare earth metals, and uh, I don't know, I mean, it's such easier said than done, but man, I think it would be awesome if people could start designing products that would uh, not just become trash, but would actually become, I don't know, something else that could be recycled or re implemented in some other way or be more useful than just a means to make money and be a product that would be. Um, disposed of and you know um, anyway what do we got here we're talking about batteries <laughs> uh, what else um, that would be awesome you know, Garmin fitness bands last for a year oh wow uh, what keyboard is that oh the keyboard was the uh, Logitech um, Logitech what let's see what the name of it is uh, I don't know that it has its like number on it anywhere actually uh if you just look up bluetooth wireless logitech keyboard um i'm sure you'll find it there's only so many um it looks like this it's got uh backlit keys and very thin silver and black it's great get it it's worth it <laughs> um all right Anyway, uh, Keyshot has RTX support. Yeah, I know. I just uh, I just upgraded both uh, both systems. I, I upgraded my uh, old license and I bought a new one for my portable uh, system. So uh, the uh, Keyshot for ZBrush. So yeah, I am stoked to start rendering things. I did a test render on this machine with the. Uh, with the uh, RTX turned on, and holy shit, the thing was incredibly fast. Like, so much faster than the CPU rendering. Um, I mean, it was just a few seconds, and it looked like a final render. It was nuts. And this was like, with global illumination turned on, uh, bounce lights, caustics, like everything. <laughs> it was, I was like, and done. I'm like, what? This is, this is the future. This is awesome. Um... Yeah, I was just watching the... Oh, yeah, the Joe Rogan podcast. Yeah, man, I love Joe Rogan's podcast. Uh, I just love the guests he has on, and I love that he's just very frank and uh, and very honest about things. Um, yeah, I'm a, I'm a... You know, in a lot of ways, I'm a very, like, kind of um, middle-of-the-road kind of guy. I just like to see people get along, and I feel like uh, I think we need more people to start looking for more common ground with each other. And that's why, again, I'm not a fan of, like, 
the main media, you know, I don't trust CNN, I don't really trust Fox, I don't trust a lot of them, because, I mean, it's, I mean, there are good people on both sides, I'm sure, but uh, there's also just a lot of bias, and there's also a lot of spin, and uh, I think that that just helps divide people when a lot of times we all want the same thing, or generally, um, and a lot of people often say a lot of the same things just from different angles. Uh, I mean, it's not, and I'm not naive to, s to say that or think that everyone is, is all on the same page, really, but I think there's just a lot more, there's a lot more common ground or middle ground that people can find with each other um, if we just, uh, just try to be nicer to each other and um, try not to focus on the extremes of the differences, um, but try to find, find common ground and try to treat others like you'd like to be treated. Uh, yeah. I think if you operate with an idea of kindness and uh, humility, uh, gentleness, and friendliness, uh, you're going to go a lot further in life than if you're just trying to bite everyone's heads off and uh, looking to argue. Um, yeah, I'm a big fan of peace. <laughs> uh, so, anyway, uh, so the opposite of build to last. I mean, built to last, yeah, I think the, the idea of built to last is, of course, great. Um, but like I said, everything does become obsolete eventually. Everything, Almost everything is replaced or has an improvement upon, which it just makes sense eventually to upgrade because you may have to keep up with the pace of, of whatever piece of tech you're uh, working with. So um, I think built to last is a good idea, but it, I think you can also build something that can last that's durable. I mean, what does last mean except to be durable over you know, duration of time over a long period of time. So yeah, build everything at high quality, but also build it in a way that it can be broken down to into components and recycled or, you know, reused in some way. Um, but that's, you know, it's a dream world. <laughs> it's my ideal. Um, eggs can't live without backlit keys. Yeah, man. Um, Epstein did commit suicide. Yeah, yeah. No, real, no, really. Anyone with half a brain, I think, uh, uh, gets that. <laughs> uh, hilarious. Yeah, I mean, it's not hilarious, but I just mean it's 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 almost becoming a meme, right? People are just uh, uh, people are bringing that up left and right everywhere. I, I think it's it's pretty obvious. The dude was killed. Anyway, uh, sorry, we should get off politics. Um, yeah, the whole thing's a mess. Sculpting. All right. Anyone have sculpting questions? We've lost like I don't know some people. We gained some others. So I guess here's a question for the audience, for those listening. Um, are all you guys ZBrush users? Uh, does anyone want to say like I don't know, are there senior people in here or are there junior artists? Are there uh, how many professional artists like if you want to give a shout out to say like either where you work or or I don't know if anyone if anyone out there wants to share like something about their uh, their ZBrush uh, usage that'd be great let's get some relevant topics here I don't want Pixelogic to be like that stream was too random <laughs> I honestly haven't watched a lot of other streamers because I uh, I'm lucky to be busy, uh, but that means that I don't really have a lot of context for a ton of uh, the dialogue that goes on with a lot of streamers. Um, I mean, I think I've seen some where I shouldn't say that I haven't seen any of them. I've seen some, but it's like a lot of them seem to just be um, um, very uh, tutorial-like, which is great. Um, I guess for this though, since this is kind of a mid-process thing, this is just sculpting, you know, this is pretty, uh, this is right now, it's just kind of getting the look, you know, just trying to figure out what this is really gonna look like. I mean, I, I feel good where it's, it's going, um, but again, like, uh, knowing that it's gonna be printed, uh, I really have got to, um, start tightening up some things and start getting in the nitty-gritty, but, um, yeah. Uh, questions. You know, that is a very good question. How do I recycle my wasted print support structures? Um, <laughs> dude, I am, uh, I'm not gonna lie. It's, uh, it's, uh, hard, uh, to do that because a lot of the plastics chemically, uh, cannot be, 
um, kind of like genie out of the bottle kind of thing, right? Like once you uh, once you take it out, you can't put it back. Uh, so once you print something with uh, SLA resin, it's chemically changed from what it was to what it is after it's printed. So you can't like melt it down and uh, turn it back into a resin. It doesn't work that way. It's a photopolymer, so that means it's cured by light, of course. So um, it's uh, you know covalent bonds happen there that can't be changed. So to answer your question, I guess I cannot recycle uh, the plastics that are printed. So it's uh, it is a problem. It's something that I'm not a fan of, and I've voiced my concern to the powers that be uh, that produce the resins, uh, and they know, and they are also um, just as concerned about it as far as the employees go, and you know, people who uh, who make it. They they would like there to be um, more options, and I know that they have chemical engineers who are working on it. So whether or not their solutions will be found anytime soon. Uh, who's to say? Um, but there's inherently a challenge with uh, a photopolymer because uh, it's something that is chemically in one state and then it goes to another and to retain its properties I think means that um, it's inherently just not a uh, environmentally friendly non-toxic um, liquid. So yeah, um, I think if there was a way to print and true rubber or silicone, things that are more inert and um, safer in the body or in contact with uh, the environment, it would be better. I mean, I guess rubber, once it's vulcanized, I guess it's probably not very safe for the environment either. It's like what tires are. I mean, rubbers, rubber comes from trees originally, but then, um, you know, it's treated, it's superheated, it's, there's a whole bit of stuff done to it that um, normally, naturally, you know, rubber deteriorates in nature when it comes out of a tree um, it, it sort of disintegrates over time um, but uh, once it's treated in a certain way I don't know the exact process but uh, I just remember hearing that uh, you know the way rubber was actually kind of invented apparently was like an accident like so many things um, the guy who found it like dropped it in a pan or something and then it turned into like an elastic kind of uh, tough material and, uh, and he was like, oh, <laughs> this could be useful. And uh, lo and behold, we got tires and soles for shoes and everything else rubber's applied to. Grips on your bike handles and rubber bands. Anyway, um, <laughs> do, do, do. do you think these cloud wisps could be a problem for 3D printing? Yeah, the cloud wisps, yeah, that's what, kind of why I'm eliminating them. Uh, the cloud wisps will be, I mean, they could probably print. I'm just not sure that I'm happy with them. I kind of want to do a little reset here. Um, but I look back at a, a few of the little iterations I had, and there was, there was too much of a, a gap between what I had made and, and uh, where this is. So I'm kind of, I'm kind of just going back a bit. Um, I'm just trying to get to more neutral kind of state here. But yeah, I really want to have this be like a, you know, a really kind of epitomized, uh, kind of glorified moment. So I'm trying to go for, um, pull out all the stops, but uh, I also don't want to feel, I don't want it to feel too disjointed. Like I'm having fun with these swirls, um, but I don't know, I don't know. It's like, do I want to make it smaller? Do I want to kill that, this swirl right here? I don't know. Like I'm liking how this, these kind of curl over here. This feels a little bit more natural. But it's a supernatural event, so I mean, I don't know. Still, it's like you want there to be kind of a, a visual kind of covalence, sort of a, you know, adherence. Visually, you want to have something that kind of tie together. And I feel like this, this thing right now is kind of just too smooth and a little too whimsy. I don't know. But I like that it kind of, again, it's like that feeling of like, power being pressed, like the air pressure being pushed aside and pushed out, kind of flowing outward from his face. Um, I kind of want it to have that, that sort of power and that feel. Um, yeah, let's see here. What do we got? Questions? Uh, 
in the long run, 3D printing reduces pollution, though. Um, I guess. I hope so. I mean, if you can efficiently create only what you need through 3D printing, yeah, I think that it, in a lot of ways it can. It can benefit um, by reducing plastic waste, um, by allowing consumers only to make what they need, um, in theory, you know. So it depends. It, it really, it's a case by case kind of basis. But yeah, I, I, I can see your your point for sure. Um, do, 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 do. You can use filament with alcohol and make a sludge out of it. It's using heat bed before. You. Yeah. Yeah, S7. Yeah, I've, I've heard about that. Oh, Carlos. Carlos on Facebook. Uh, PET recycled filament. Yeah, I, yeah, I wondered about that, you know. Um, yeah, I have read about that. Yeah, um, it's a good question, Carlos. Um, if you're still out there. Uh, yeah, I would love to sample some of your filament, man. That'd be great. Uh, thank you. Um, if you can find me on Facebook, you can just send me a message on there, man. Um, you can just look at my full name. It's not easy to find. Um, but, uh, yeah, let me know if that can print on, like, an Ultimaker um, uh, Extended 3 uh, or a MakerBot Replicator 2. It uh, probably would work better on the Ultimaker, I'm guessing. Yeah. that there's this brush I was thinking about the other day and I remember I used it used it on this in the past um, I think it was it called crinkle is it called a crinkle brush something like that um, oh, where is that brush was it crinkle I think it was crinkle maybe I forget if that was successful or not, actually. I just remember it gave really interesting texture. Uh, any of you guys remember that brush? Crumple. Oh, never mind. There it is. Got it. Ha, crumple. Crinkle, crumple. Um, all right, turn off RGB. All right, is this doing anything? Let me crank up the Z intensity. There we go. Getting some. Yeah, I don't know. I might have to just do noise and like kind of use the uh, I don't know clay buildup brush. Yeah, I don't know crumple. It's more like a papery kind of crumple. It's not really like a. <laughs> I don't know. I guess when you think of clouds, you don't think of crumpling clouds. You think of clumping clouds. I don't know. Uh, yeah, that's probably not gonna work. Oh man, it's been so long since I've touched this. Um, what else could work? Uh, let's see how soft clay does. See, the cool thing about trying something new too, uh, in sculpture or in uh, 3D printing that you uh, you may not have thought to do or ever tried to do before is that it makes you experiment with uh, different tools, and in this case, trying different brushes, things that I've either only tried once or twice or never touched actually um, so yeah this is actually working nicely um, so we got any more questions out there anybody have any uh, any curiosities Some other uh, 
think I have some of the clouds that I've made a little while ago that are based off of these. Uh, let me see if I can, uh, can find those. I'll bring them in here. Yeah, got some others in here. Um, what are these? I think these are OBJs. Yeah, clouds are such a weird thing to sculpt, man. It's um, it's definitely not a typical assignment. Project Terroride. It's the Lincoln Clouds. And yes, sir, this is a concept sculpt that I had started a while back here at home before I was walking into uh, MPC to work on it, which it never made it to the final film, sadly. Um, but yes, this is uh, this is to be Mufasa in the clouds, the way I, in, a, in a type of way that I would have loved to have seen it. Um, let's see here, Just drop in a couple stars, and then replace these guys with uh, some other clouds. Kind of feel like we need some back. You know, we need some sort of some sort of filler. I kind of think I want to make an arc, sort of like a nice curve back here, and sort of give him like a give him like a nice maybe a cloud halo kind of in the back, sort of like in the original. You know, where you kind of had this like tunnel, sort of, um, almost like a tunnel to heaven. Or like uh, if any of you guys have played the game Journey, um, there's this beautiful scene where you're going up the, at the end, near the end of the journey, you're going up this amazing tunnel of clouds, almost like you're inside the center of a tornado or a hurricane. It's really beautiful, kind of epic, fast travel through a tunnel of clouds. It's really cool. Um, all right, let's see here. Where are we going? And... FBXs. I love how Windows just says type 3D object. It doesn't tell you what kind. Uh, okay, yeah, these are FBXs. That's what I did. Alright, so we'll do the FBX importer. Boom. So FBX importer, I forgot, it uh, just brings it into its own thing. It doesn't really bring it in here, so I can delete these guys. very dramatic but not menacing <laughs> thanks man yeah that's the idea right um, like I was saying earlier I think Mufasa's character is um, he's like that ideal dad kind of character right he's strong he's masculine um, he's a protector uh, but he's also gentle you know, like I was saying earlier um, power under control strength under control it's uh, it's kind of the uh, the ideal I think uh, masculine character Sort of this godlike sort of figure, very noble. Um, yeah. Mm, let's see. This is the other. This is the other joy of ZBrush, man. It's just these kind of moments when you can just you can just play with shapes and like this was designed. I think when I made this cloud, whenever um, it was designed to kind of that was the base sort of down here but 
Yeah, we can just dynamesh that out of here and blend it into the rest of the clouds here. And who cares? It doesn't matter. I feel like Bob Ross at this moment. You know, like, eh, we got some happy clouds. We're just, uh, some happy trees. And, uh, oh, it's a happy accident. Let's just, let's just go with it. <laughs> Anybody here old enough to remember the original? Did anyone else watch, uh, the original Bob Ross on PBS back in the day? I used to love that, that show as a kid. And then eventually would fall asleep to his incredibly kind and soft, gentle voice. <laughs> But I always was like, this is this is fun watching this guy paint. I was like, he's amazing. <laughs> um, do, do, do. Uh, S7. What's the poster pick to your left? To me, it looks like some kind of zebish chart. No. <laughs> yeah, no, it was, a, it was a matrix poster. Yeah, it's a matrix poster, dude. Yeah, you got it. Um, yes, sir. Uh, the poster, yeah, this one, I'm a huge... Uh, Matrix fan, like super huge. Um, so this poster, I think, if I remember correctly, I got it on eBay um, earlier this year or late last year. Um, sorry, my dog's just making some noises. One sec. Hey, buddy. All right, okay. All right, just making sure. He's uh, my dog was just really sick recently, so I'm just making sure he's not like having any uh, any other recurrences. Um, the, so the uh, the poster um, that was a find, dude. That's uh, uh, I think that's like one of only three hundred ever made, or something like that. So it's a um, so it's a uh, it's a uh, foil kind of lenticular sort of reflective um, poster that has the um, sort of like reflective foil kind of interwoven with the the matrix code. It's pretty badass. Uh, love it. Yeah, that's the uh, first film, man, I saw it in theaters. And I remember it was in a time when they really nailed, like, the uh, teaser for it. And uh, I'm just, I'm a huge fan of really well-done teasers. And I really wish that uh, people, filmmakers, would take note and just keep doing this. Like, do what they did back in the day. Don't give away the whole film in a trailer already. Like, goddamn, haven't people learned their lesson yet? <laughs> Um, it's uh, it's too many films to tell you the whole story in, in the trailer, and it's just terrible. Um, the original teaser for The Matrix is great because you have no idea what you're going to see. You just know it looks badass, and it looks like there's a lot of crazy action and some sort of crazy science fiction elements to it. And and uh, then you walk in. I, I'm speaking from my personal experience. You walk in the theater, sit down, figure you're going to be in for some cool action. You heard some critics say some good things, whatever. This was like opening day, and then by the end of like the lobby scene, I'm just my jaw's on the floor and I'm looking at my sister because I went with my sister and my dad and the three of us went and I was just thinking in my head holy shit what the hell is this this is fucking awesome like and it's not over like that would be the end for most movies right or like the helicopter scene you think oh wow what an ending right the crap the helicopter hits the the glass of that building it does this incredible ripple blows up she's coming to her camera just these one iconic shot after another and it's just to me, that's what filmmaking should be. It, you should be, it's a visual medium, right? So if you're not creating a visual feast that at almost any moment you can pause a film and take a snapshot of that screen and then frame that as a work of art, if you're not, if filmmakers aren't operating in the frame of mind of like a photographer where your com composition is, is so important, right? How you place the camera, where you place it, um, Symmetry is not always bad, right? Some people always want to say, like, oh, never have, you know, a horizon in line with... No, symmetry can be powerful sometimes, too. I mean, it can be mundane if you're not wise, or it can be boring, but it can also be very powerful and very much um, artistic. So, I don't know. I think... Uh, anyway, to digress, I just think that films... So many films do not have uh, nearly as uh, incredible level of artistry and composition and power, visual power to them that uh, films like The Matrix does and um, it's very much like a comic book like you know I'm sure you guys have seen the storyboards that they uh, had their buddies in the comic industry like draw out like almost every major frame and uh, it shows man just just those so many iconic shots and just so well composed um, you know and uh, yeah I'm a huge fan of that movie because of of all the things that it encompasses it's smart, it's uh, action-packed, it, sh it showed us something new, too. That's another big reason why I love The Matrix. It, it gave us um, it 
gave us uh, visuals that we'd never seen before, right? So like bullet time, you know, we no one had ever seen anything like that before. I think there was that one Gap commercial, the Gap khakis ad, Jump Jive and Whale. That stuck in my head the first time I saw it because I was like, I've never seen anything like this. Like I, I know it's it's real but it's not because they stopped this guy does this vault over a woman he's dancing with or swing dancing and uh they stop it in mid jump and then they rotate and then they continue going with the dance and i'm like this is effing awesome like how do they do that and uh and then i kind of just never got answers because the internet barely existed <laughs> and then i saw the matrix and then i was like wow this is this is a new level of something that we've never seen and really I don't think anyone has done anything with it very good since like I can't think of any movie that's utilized bullet time and so I'm really kind of cautiously optimistic about the new Matrix movie uh, Keanu is kind of on this um, Keanu Reeves is kind of on this uh, keanu sans <laughs> this Keanu renaissance lately because the John Wick movies are freaking great I love them uh, but we're not seeing uh, as far as bullet time goes they haven't they haven't touched it and I don't know if People just don't want to touch it because it's it's they think it's cliche or they think it's it's it just can't be done as well as the Matrix did. I don't know why people aren't using it at all, but I definitely have ideas for utilizing uh, bullet time in a film or two that I would love to make. Um, but only in key moments where you can you can show something from one angle and the audience is on the ride for that moment, and then if you rotate it, you show a completely different like. I don't know, some, the character has something in their hand that you don't see from one side, but when you do the rotation, it's a reveal. I don't know. There's so many, I think there's so many things that we can play with in filmmaking right now. We have such an incredible tool set, and yet we're seeing such limited usage of it. I, I think it's really a shame. Um, but I guess that's why people like myself and others have to kind of push to get involved in this industry, because, uh, I don't know, I'm not seeing as much innovation now as, uh, as we did back in the 80s and 90s. Uh, I think bullet time is an amazing tool that is just no one's using it anymore for anything, um, and that's why I, that's kind of it, by coincidence that's why I have those top three movies I had listed earlier like Jurassic Park, The Matrix, and Interstellar. Uh, each of them showed us something new that we'd never seen before. Um, you could throw Terminator Two in there as well, but I think Jurassic Park was really that film that really kind of was the incredible mixture of all these different uh, all these different epitome of tools and ideas and. Everything, just great score, great story, amazing visuals. Um, yeah, it just, it just, they, all these films showed us something we'd never seen before, and it was just, uh, there's a definitely a before and after moment with these films, right? Like, The Matrix was, um, there was the film industry before The Matrix, and then there was the film industry after The Matrix. Um, and the same for Jurassic Park, same for Terminator 2, um, and I think in maybe lesser ways, unfortunately, the same for Interstellar. Um, being, again, a huge science nerd, um, I was so impressed that they used Kip Thorne, who's a real... Kip Thorne is a, uh, an actual um, astrophysicist. Um, and they hired him to work on uh, Interstellar to do the math to create the uh, gravitational lensing, which is the way that light bends around the black hole. And also, I guess, how you create a uh, mathematically meaning also like the way it should look in reality, like a wormhole, right? Two different things. A wormhole is a three-dimensional hole in space-time, right? So it's like a, you know, that whole, the whole 2D thing where they fold a piece of paper and push a pencil through it, which they stole from uh, Event Horizon. <laughs> but that whole thing, they showed three dimensions, that sphere, right? They explain it, then they break it down for you in the movie, and then they show it to you. And... I, I don't know. I, I was freaking out when I saw that. I was like, wow, this is the first time human eyes have really seen this, right, ever, really. And it was done mathematically accurately. So we know we're, what we're looking at would be as close to reality as we could ever see it. Then the black hole was the next leap, and it's two, two in the same movie, right? You saw a black hole for the first time ever mathematically accurately represented. And then flash forward now, whatever, how many years later, like three, four years later, they used all these different telescopes from around the world to focus in on one black hole that we found and take a really pixelated photo of the first ever photo of a black hole. And guess what? It looks like a really pixelated version of Interstellar's incredibly beautiful black hole, the Gargantua. So I'm like, dude, this just I think it went over so many people's heads they didn't even realize what they were looking at. They just like, oh, some cool sci-fi shit that I've seen in, you know, CG in a movie. And it, uh, it just sort of it boiled me a little bit because I'm like, wow, people don't... 
enough people aren't talking about this, but again, that's the science nerd in me, I guess. It's like, dude, we're seeing something that human eyes had never seen before, right? We're the first generation to really see this. Um, that's incredible. Again, filmmaking capitalizing on the visual medium. Uh, I just think that uh, there's so much artistry that can be done in film that we're just not seeing. Um, yeah, so anyway, I'm a broken record now. Well, what do we got? Uh, sorry, I'm gonna, I've got some backlog questions. Um, show us the dog. <laughs> yeah, okay, I'll, I'll pick him up in a minute. Um, <laughs> uh, he beat those pair of brushes to a pulp. Wait, S7, yeah, he beat those pair of brushes to a pulp. Uh, what am I missing here? Paint brushes. Oh, 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 yeah, Bob Ross, gotcha. <laughs> uh, the Matrix trailer was really good for me. Yeah, yeah. The Matrix trailer was good. Same with, uh, like, Jurassic Park um, teaser. The original Jurassic Park teaser trailer is kind of awesome. Um, they show you almost nothing, really nothing in the movie. Um, the guys in the mine, mine shaft, they're, like, you know, digging for um, Amber. And then they zoom in on that one Amber with a cloudy little, you know, um, mosquito. Excuse me, and then they, um, they zoom into it, light flares, and then they cut to um, a beautiful like slice of that of that amber where the mosquitoes in it, and they have a a guy with a really deep voice. He sounded like one of the guys from National Geographic, so it had this weight to it, like it was almost like a news broadcaster or somebody from you know National Geographic talking to you, and they speak of it almost like the way they do in the novel, like as if these events really happened and this was like a recorded thing like a recorded history and uh, I think he says something about it you know discovered a mine in Costa Rica and blah 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 and the camera zooms into again like using the camera in ways that it's just you know not quite so common but smart so they uh, they took the camera and they zoom into the eyepiece of the microscope so that you can see what you know the scientists would see looking at the mosquito and then as they rotate the lenses to zoom in closer into the mosquito, you zoom into the eye of the mosquito. And the narrator is just speaking of how they were able to re-engineer dinosaurs and mankind and dinosaur would live together in the first time. And uh, as they zoom in through the, the uh, compound eye of the mosquito, you hear this roar of a T-Rex, but you know, it's a mixture of course of a lion and an elephant, whatever, but it sounds unique enough where you know it's a dinosaur. and. Uh, and then he says it happened at a place called Jurassic Park, and blah, 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 this summer Steven Spielberg will take you there. And then you hear this other roar and all these other animal sounds kind of trail off, and it's just this incredible artistry to it, just a really beautiful, simple, and yet highly intriguing teaser. And that alone was like, I'm sold, I want to see this movie, just because there was such a great execution in delivering the, the tease, right? You're just you're giving someone a taste and the idea, you're giving them pictures in their head. And then, of course, this is one of those few times where the pictures kind of blew away what you could even imagine, I think. Um, we just saw things we'd never seen before. And there was that watershed moment where now the world has seen the closest thing probably ever will see to real dinosaurs. And, um, yeah, that was that was an amazing moment. I'm a big fan of good teaser trailers. Um, wow, what are the questions that we got here? Uh... Tim the Ancient, I still remember getting blown away watching that movie in the theater for the first time. Uh, the Matrix, yeah, yeah, it was it was incredible. Uh, play some NCS, no copyright sound song. Um, I, you know, I need to do my homework before I do that. But yeah, thanks, dude. I I will definitely be figuring out music for the next time. So, uh, you know, but you guys can always listen to music on your end too. You know, put on some stuff then uh, figure out the levels <laughs> so it doesn't drown out my uh, musings. Uh, what do we got? Uh, I'll give the new Matrix a chance. Could be really interesting. Yeah, I'm curious. I'm very optimistically, uh, cautiously optimistic. There we go. Sorry, it's been a long day. Um, using the type of recording in UFC live in 3D. Oh, yeah, I have seen Bullet Time, yeah, in football, and uh, I haven't seen it in UFC, but uh, that'd be pretty cool to see. Um, yeah, I mean, and I've seen it even um, here in LA. There are different, I'm a Sony camera user, um, so Sony Alpha cameras, um, and they put on some really cool events every now and then that are free to attend, if, especially if you're like a, you know, camera user of theirs. And um, 
their mirrorless cameras are awesome, by the way. And uh, I went to the, one of their events that they had uh, last summer. Oh, was it this summer? I don't remember. Anyway, it was the last summer or the summer. Anyway, great event. And there were some guys who had this uh, company that they set up these um, bullet time cameras. So it's like a whole bunch of like web cameras like this or... Um, I don't know if they were all web cameras. Maybe there was two different times. One time it was the PlayStation Experience, um, which is like, you know, the, the PlayStation um, E3, basically. And they had another company there that had the same thing. And I think they were more like DSLRs or mirrorless cameras. But they had this array of like a half ring of cameras and set up to a laptop, had all the software hooked up, and then you'd have to do a pose. I think it was for Spider-Man. It was the new Spider-Man game coming out. And uh, I, I did like a, a jump kick and timed it just right so then they they have the whole rotation, you know, the half rotation of whatever you're doing in midair kind of going around. That was pretty cool. Uh, but again, this is like kind of gimmicky stuff. This is stuff for consumers just to kind of have fun with. Uh, I want to see filmmakers do something with this. I don't know if people are just that creatively bankrupt, if there's no one care. I don't get why they don't use it. I don't know. I'm a fan. I think it'd be cool if it was well done. And uh, it's too bad no one's doing anything with it. <laughs> um, uh, what else do we got here? Uh, my questions using type of recording now. You see, yeah, yeah. Uh, Sliders three hundred, yeah. Bullet time for crazy zooming. Yeah, I think they actually use like two different cameras, right? For three hundred, um, kind of zooming in and out. But they, it's not really bullet time. That's just slow mo, I guess. Um, I'm talking like actual like freeze frame or reducing motion while rotation is happening around the subject. Um, that's uh, I think more classic, you know, bullet time. Um, and that's what I, I would just love to see more of, or just, I don't know, doing something unique with it, you know? Um, I know some people aren't a fan of things like this, but I love seeing impossible camera shots and where you, you don't know it's CG that you're looking at until you realize that they're putting a camera in a place where you could never put a camera, you know, or traveling through something. So, okay, like we know it's CG, of course, but like the opening to Fight Club. It's fun, right? You start at like the neur neuron level and you pull out through his nose or through his mouth, or his mouth, right, with the gun. Um, uh, Panic Room did an amazing, I think it was Fincher, right? It did an amazing full CG shot where they cut from um, a real set and then they, I think it was green screen or whatever from a real set and they have green screen around it or something and then they rotate and it's all CG from that point forward. But the lighting, everything matches perfectly. So once they pass over like the countertop and through a teapot handle and through a chair then you realize this is not possible now today we could probably do it with mini drones i guess and uh, 4k cameras i've seen some really awesome stuff with um like image um video video uh stabilization um and uh all kinds of um all kinds of crazy stuff like that where they can do incredible uh do incredible shots with a, a drone and then um you know, they uh, they get some some footage. They stabilize it, and the drone is really small, and they fly through incredible incredible angles. I mean, that's something pretty cool too. But uh, I don't know. All I guess I'm trying to say is I would just love to see filmmakers really push the envelope some more creatively, because uh, I just feel like we get a lot of the same stuff now. And, and I don't go to the movie theater walking out saying, "Oh my God, I can't believe what I just saw," and I need someone else to come back and see it with me again. And that's the kind of stuff I want to make, you know. That kind of that's the kind of filmmaking I want to see, and that's what I want to produce. Um, why we're not getting more of that? I I'm only guessing it's because Hollywood producers executives are extremely risk averse, and they're afraid to bet on unknown commodities quantities. Um, I guess that's my only my only understanding for why we're not seeing more uh, more content that's original and mind blowing. Um, we should watch longer, but it's late. Cool, see the stream. Thanks, man. Thanks. Um, you know, and I'm just realizing I think I've gone way over time. Just gotten to uh, chatting, so it's 10:26. I think I was only supposed to go until 10. So, uh, yeah, I'm guessing that I should probably put a fork in it. <laughs> uh, contact mirror shot. Uh, Carlos, got it. Thank you. Um, all right. Well, guys, uh, thanks so much for hanging out. I mean, apparently, we got like 73 people in here right now. It's a pretty good number. Um, 
yeah, if anyone has any last minute questions, I'll hang here for a few more minutes. If there's any other questions, statements, um, but I'll probably, uh, I'll probably just uh, save here and I'll come back to this. Um, I'll probably keep working on this maybe throughout the week. Uh, I'll try to post some stuff on uh, Instagram maybe. Um, if you guys want to follow me on Instagram, uh, it's at Daniel Lion Arts. So three words, but as one word. And I'll, I'll type it in the chat here. I guess this goes out to everybody. Um, so uh, if you guys want to follow work. I also post stuff about my dog and my life uh, in general. <laughs> Uh, S7, thanks, man. Um, all right, so let's see. Is that right? That's right. Okay. And somebody asked to see the pup. So, uh, let's see. Did that did that go through, by the way, uh, to the chat? It looks like it just did, hopefully. It's got a bunch of check marks. Um, I guess it did, just in case. There we go. I guess it works the same way. All right, sorry, didn't mean to spam you. Um, let me grab my corgi. We'll, we'll peace out with this. One sec. Hi, son. Come here, buddy. Come here. Come here. Oh, this is so this is uh, this is Einstein, or Ein. If anyone knows Cowboy Bebop, uh, you get the reference. But uh, this is the Corgi. The poor guy had, uh, we're not sure if it was like pancreatitis or what, no one really knew. Uh, but he is, he is the best dog. <laughs> he's loyal, he's loving, he's crazy. He's 11 and a half years old and still kicking. So he's just made almost a full recovery. A little bit slow still, but um, anyway. Yeah, this is Ayn. <laughs> Yeah, he's my best buddy. I flew out here five and a half years ago with six suitcases and and him, and that was it. Uh, all right, guys. Um, thanks again for uh, hanging out and checking everything out. Um, yeah, I'll try to send some updates over uh, Instagram, and hopefully uh, I'll see you guys back here in like a week or two. All right, take care. Um, I wish you the best and happy to see brushy. We'll see ya. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. S7, thanks, man. Yeah, she probably does. <laughs> All right. All right. Take care, guys. Have a good night. <laughs>